So welcome everybody. I'm Zoe Turner. I'm a data scientist with Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust, which serves a um, population of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire and a few other areas outside that region. And uh, we offer or we provide mental health and general health services as a very large trust. And I've been doing the NHSR introduction to r and studio. I've been very lucky, I feel, to be able to deliver it once a month as a volunteer. It was originally a volunteer process each month through I think it was the year 2020 last year every month which made me better at delivering it but I have delivered this also at previous conferences so I'm also doing three things I'm trying to allow people to come into the room as well so I've asked previously before we started what people were using and quite a lot of people are using their PCs today which is wonderful to see that things are already installed because that can be quite a big issue getting stuff started but we're going to I'm going to use the cloud myself today which is already pre-set up and if anybody is also using it I'll also be working through how you do it and you may wish to use the cloud for some of the other workshops that we've got throughout this conference this year and maybe for previous years or even because they're on YouTube or future years as they come up. So as you can see on my screen, I hope, please do let me know either shout out or in the chat. I, on the left hand of the screen, I've got uh, like a the website, which is what I'm going to use to go into the, each of the slides. And on the right, I've got the cloud as I've opened up the project myself. I just wanted to kind of like do a check just to make sure if anybody is using the cloud that you are all set up that you can see or have seen what I've got open on the right hand side of my screen. If not, could you just let me know and we can try and work that through. Part of this course is to get you all started because that can be really the daunting bit for when you're really new to this. Um, it certainly was for me, like the technology breaks and then you're not sure if it's the code or the technology. So we're trying to get that bit sorted. It's very quiet. I'm assuming everything's OK. If things break, because this is all kind of virtual, we've had it before where the cloud has just stopped working. Um, I'll keep going, it's recorded, you can then refer back to it or we can pick it up later. And I just wish to share with everybody, you can always find help on the NHSR Slack, um, which I will share the link at some point, I'm sure. And I'll always be there and lots of other people are there to help with these kind of things too. So I'm getting, silence which is always a good thing so I think we'll just start with the introduction. I've actually introduced myself which is good. Oops you can see my notes that'll be interesting. Um, the agenda on the first slide here is for when this was an in-person event so this was one of the very first courses that was written when NHSR community first started. Um, it, was it is hosted still by the Midlands and Lancashire CSU and it was written by some great colleagues in that organisation. So this is for a day event, but we've broken this down over two half days now just to, it's a lot of content, there's a lot in our, so the lunch where it says here in the middle, as you'd expect, is our lunch break today, but we're going to pick this up again tomorrow for the rest of the, uh, the afternoon as it would be in this slide. So we're going to do some import using our studio, sorry, I forgot that bit. That's the key part, getting it set up, explaining it, importing the data using Excel, which is the most familiar way, but there are other ways as well. I'll refer to that. Um, ggplot2, which is a visualization tool and talk more about functions. And that's going to be this morning. We're going to finish around 12.30, one o'clock today, I hope. It all depends on how technically we get through and some of the issues, and that's fine. So the course aims, um, because R is huge, there's a lot to learn, is really to show you the possibilities and the sort of exciting parts of some exciting parts, because there's a lot of them in R, to give you a feel of how it works and to show you enough so that you can get started yourself to find resources that suit you and just to point you in the right direction, because there's a lot out there. I'm going to start with a few pictures, though, some graphics, because it's always really nice. So I've updated these from the original course because through the pandemic, we got some excellent, uh, freely available uh, visualizations using the tools that we're going to show you today, or I'm going to show you today, using the Royal We there, sorry, um, like this heat map that was produced from Colin Angus, who works at the University of Sheffield. I think he spoke last year at last year's conference, so you could, you could find that on YouTube. And he talked about, I think it was around the COVID visualizations that he did, or it was certainly around that subject. So this is, is not up to date. I just used the one with the first wave that we had. So these are all the English local authorities with the heat map showing 
the sort of like the increase in numbers of cases. I think it was, yes, there's cases at the top. The page actually is a link so we can go to the GitHub that Colin Angus used or he shares with people so you can find the heat map code and the data that was available and what he used. And that is something I really like about R is that you can take people's code if they freely if they make it freely available and ref use that code to produce your own charts. And I've used his heat map code with different data just so that it was working for the heat map, but put something else in and I got something very similar. So it's very inspirational in that regard. Now, this was from the original um, slides that we had or that we used. And I can't find the original code, though, unfortunately. It wasn't a healthcare related um, data blog, but it was about the London. It's showing how you can do charts and visualizations with geospatial um, information. So, this is the London cycle higher journeys with the high, over a period, I suppose, this is pre pandemic, with the uh, the thickness of the road denoting the frequency of use of the cycles, which is a really nice way of mixing both geospatial and chart information. I sort of referred with Colin Angus's slide before that you can do collaboration. By collaboration, I mean we can see his code, he shares it, and you can contribute to that code. So if you see something that's a mistake, spelling mistake, or looking at the wrong data, or uh, an error in the code, a bug, or even help with that, you can collaborate using GitHub and our community generally more widely, as well as the NHSR community, have an expectation, I feel, of sharing that code. I'd also say Python probably do the same too. It's just not a language that I've really been exposed to that much, but I haven't quite seen that in the same way as say SQL or Excel is actually even harder to share that information because it's not a scripted language. And that brings me to reprodu reproducibility. So you'll hear that a lot in terms of R and Python and other data science languages in that we can take the code that's scripted and reproduce it time and time again. It's a bit harder with things where you have to click and drop because you have to explain those actions. And I know between my past self and my current self and my future self, doing that is really difficult even when it's just for you yourself remembering each step that you've made. So R really does help with reproducibility. And that kind of culminates in this thing right at the bottom, which is called our markdown. And this is an example of the slide that was used originally by the authors of this um, slide deck. In automated reports using our markdown, there is a new report system, and I'll mention that just afterwards, but this particular thing is showing you, um, it, it, I think it was for trusts using ED, so um, emergency department, I always forget what ED stands for, I always think of A&E, uh, emergency department patient numbers and referrals and they were producing a report that had the same content not content but the content layout I suppose but different content specific to that trust repeatedly and so you can automate your reports using R markdown so the this was using what thousands of unique graphs according to the trust that it related to unique tables and then the production was from R into PowerPoint which could be then distributed I mentioned the new form of this. We're going to cover tomorrow at the end of the session, our markdown, and I've used our markdown a lot myself, but this year our studio, as it was, had a conference where a couple of changes were made. One of them is that the company name is changing to Posit because they're broadening, or they have already broadened to be fair, their remit of what languages that they support, but they wanted to sort of move away from the R name because they're also working with Python and Julia. But as part of that, they were they've been working on something called Quarto, which is like R Markdown, very, very similar, very familiar to people who are R users. But Quarto is really, really exciting for people who are not R users, Python and Julia and all these other languages for them to sort of access the, the greatness that occurs with R Markdown. So for the moment, we've got R Markdown and Quarto, but you'll start hearing in the kind of resources that I'm going to share with you later in the course. Um, that name. And so it's just to say, we will be covering that, I'm sure. It's something I want to get involved with and I'll share my learning. I'm, I'm pretty sure I will because I, I like doing that um, in due course. But at the moment, we're going to stick with our markdown. You might have also heard or tried um, or um, been the benefit of something called Shiny Applications as well. And this one, again, is from the Midlands and Lancashire CSU. Uh, it was about mental health surge modeling. So I'll go to, I think that is the actual hosted 
dashboard and uh, it takes a while because it's here we go it's just loading because there's a lot of information behind it and this was created to um, predict not predict but not predict is to give a model I, I'm not this isn't my area for analytics it's to model the use or the impact on services for mental health after COVID or during the pandemic and I suppose afterwards I work with mental health data and this is no surprise to me that even if you change all these numbers it's it's IAT which is a talk well-being service which crops up a lot and general practice the GP services that are the most um, affected the numbers go through that system a lot more than maybe some of the others now all of this code to build it so how the um, dashboard looks and also the modeling behind it the sort of the data that goes behind it are all available through github on their systems and also what is lovely about the nhsr community is that at least one of the key people who worked with this is available through the nhsr slack group which i will share in the chat at some point so that you have direct access and can come and join us so I found that with some of the Slack groups that we've got across the NHS and also civil service, that if you have a question over some visualization, say, you want to know how it's done, where do I find the code? The person who's created it will be available and most likely really happy to share that information with you. Another group that have been working in with um, Shiny applications and visualizations is Trafford Data Lab. And so this is their main site and they have a lot of information in there. Trafford Data Lab is part of Trafford Local Authority, I think it is, and their public health function. They were doing these visualizations, which have been out for a number of years now, and they're wonderfully designed and very accessible. Um, I'll just go through one, actually, before I always look at, um, and I've forgotten where it is now, this one, English Indices of Deprivation. So this is a shiny application as well. You can kind of tell because it sort of like needs to load. It takes a bit of time. <clears throat> and again, all the code is available for this so you can reproduce it. It defaults to Trafford because it's a Trafford site. But if I put Nottingham, if I just first of all show people before I move to Nottingham, because it's quite a difference. Trafford has very, uh, it's not a very deprived area. So the most deprived areas are the dark colors and the lighter colors are the least deprived. So you can see it in the bar chart form here. The colors used are from a package called Viridis, so they're already pre-coded. And Viridis is a really accessible, color blindness friendly in a sense um, system, but it's also really good for color definition between categories so that you can see reasonably well there. I mean, five, six, seven are quite close, but it just gives you that kind of gradient color, which works really well with maps. If I look at Nottingham though, which is where I'm based, it's the opposite. So we're a very deprived city with no eight, which is strange, but we we do have that kind of strangeness. Our affluence is in a tiny pocket in one area. And so you can use this to either find your own local authority area out of interest as a member of the general public or um, through your own work or use the code itself. You don't necessarily need that dashboard. You can find the code elsewhere. And this particular site that's on there slides is for um twitter uh is it a twitter uh what's it called scraping i think they were looking for where these keywords are being used in twitter and then they just had this very simple dashboard which you could take the data and develop not data the code to develop to collect data and do information with it i haven't done that myself but i just thought that was quite interesting most used emoji it's quite interesting now, the other thing for many people who work with um, data, and there was a few people in the chat did do this or do have access to this, they use SQL, either they use it intensively or they use it to access certain data sets, is connecting that into R. Now, today we're going to specifically cover getting CSV files or yeah, CSV files, you can get Excel in there, you can connect to SQL servers and do other things with um, other programming tools like MATLAB and SPSS, those kind of statistical tools. There were all sorts of packages out there to help you get the data or the code in. I'll just let somebody in, sorry. Um, and this is a, a reference to the webinar 
that we've got on the NHSR community website. Let me just say page not found. Ah, that needs to be updated because it's a new website. So we have some webinars that you can either see on YouTube directly at that channel or through the NHSR website to find these talks that have been put together, these webinars by volunteers across the community. My hope is that you will get to a stage, everybody here, and want to share something either through a blog or through a webinar yourself and, and contribute to the community because wherever you are in your journey with R, you will know something, you'll learn something and other people will be very interested to hear how you're getting on and what you found. So this was done by Chris Maney. So he was going through the database connections in R. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out that web page. And also there's some other code around in my list of things for this course. The next slide, which moves around, is about inclusivity. There's a number of uh, groups actually that are missing from this now, but the R community worldwide, let's say, is very inclusive generally, but out of that, there are smaller groups like Minorities in R, which has just started, well, I say just started, it's probably a few years old. My sense of time is a bit bendable, let's say. Um, there's Minorities in R, there's Asia R, R ladies you may have heard of, and of course, there's our wonderful NHSR community. So these are smaller communities within a broader community, all with this thread of inclusivity, trying to give opportunities and a voice to people who are brilliant at R or in their journey and feel supported in what they're doing so that you can share what you do and find like-minded people. I find the community spirit within R really appealing. I've always had help with SQL because I'm a SQL analyst by background, but not quite in this kind of glo global friendly system. And that's what NHSR community is also trying to promote. So the course philosophy, today's information and also tomorrow, it, it would be impossible, I think. This is kind of a, a drawing of a, a wheel taking it to a car. We're not going to do that where we, it's kind of called waterfall project management. I think this is based on agile, this slide about minimal viable product. We, we couldn't possibly go right from today and tomorrow, these two half days, you will be an R expert and you will go out and do amazing work with R. What you will do is amazing work with R, but it would be more like step by step incremental learning. And this is certainly how my journey and your journey could be faster. It could be uh, many years, which was what mine was like. I did the workshop with NHSR community and I did several other workshops after that. And I still didn't feel like I was getting anywhere with R. My main language was SQL. So I kept using SQL or mixing them up a little bit. And so it was like step by step and moving along. And then suddenly you go from a skateboard to a fast car and you think, well, how did I, how did that just suddenly rapidly move so quickly between a motorbike and a car? There's a lot that changes, but everybody's journey is different with any language and I found with R some people are really really rapid and it also depends on where you're working as well so I know certain aspects of R but there's a lot that I don't know so I don't really use it for forecasting or for visualizations all that much um, or geospatial work but there are lots of experts out there or people becoming experts so it's a it's a very long journey so you might not be going for a car you might be going for an aeroplane or um a speedboat. So the course philosophy is it's very relaxed and informal. Um, all the slides and code are available on GitHub. So uh, all our stuff is available and it's free to use for your own courses or to refer to or to change whatever you do. It, it's all freely available. There's a nice little bit here at the bottom, which was from the original slides about the truth. It can't be the whole truth. There's just too much to cover in one day. It, the R thing is enormous and as I've been learning R I've had to sort of like keep my keep my enthusiasm kind of sort of like dampen down a bit because you can go too detailed and too far into things so uh, there's, it's just a really exciting journey and I'm sure that people will go off and find your own way and then hopefully come back and share that with us in something like the conference that we're in this this uh, week and next week as well so let's begin I'm going to explain this R art versus our studio thing. Now, lots of people have got this installed on your computer, which is amazingly brilliant. Um, we have had a few problems, still do, with what access people have if they're in, if they're on, let's say, work computers. It varies from IT departments to IT department, what you can install, how you install it, and things like that. So it's great to see so many people have it installed one way or another today. 
Um, things have changed as well because our studio, the company, has become Posit. But I think from what they said, if I remember correctly, I think our studio that I'm going to refer to now in these slides is going to remain as our studio. So it's very confusing. The kind of the words flip over. R is a programming language and it's also a program that you need to install as well. So it's, it's like they use these words interchangeably and it's like a whole new language layout. So R is a programming language on the whole. Our studio is the software application and I'll explain how these two fit together. And then we've got this added confusion. Let's just say it's not really, it will settle. It's very new this year that our studio, the company that used to share the name with the programming language is now Posit. Anyway, R and R studio are useful together because they make your programming experience really nice. So to explain a bit more about R, it is a programming language. You will you most likely hear people refer to base R. It, I suppose it's hard to sort of search on the internet for R help when you just write R in there. Google, for example, there are other people, uh, other search engines out there, but R, uh, Google does learn after a bit that you that's what you're looking for. But when you put in R, it can be quite tricky. So base R is often what people are referring to when they're talking about the program language. The uh, software tool itself is very, uh, it's like in an analogy, which is what this uh, picture is showing this slide, it's very pared down, it's very fast, it's super fast really, uh, it's very efficient, it's all about efficiency and speed, which is what these cars, these race cars are like in terms of, you know, the strip down of anything that's comfortable in it, but they are really fast. And that's what base are, the language and the program are about, so they both share that kind of principle. Whereas our studio, which is what we're going to use today, which is the program, and that won't be changing its name. It's um, like a, a user GUI, is it like a GUI interface. It's a, a more friendly interface, a user friendly way of using the, pro, the, the programs. Using the modern car analogy, it's got setups to make your experience even better, more personal to you and just comfortable you've got uh, you've got a roof for example it's just a, a nicer more comfortable way of working it's not for everybody though it's not always accessible for every person so if somebody relies upon screen readers to uh, navigate or read for them um, to access communications then our programs are often better but the two can you know whatever your preference is that's that's the good thing about it you can there are some accessible features which I will cover in our studio, but it's not completely accessible. So our the program may be better for some people. Our studio has and continues to have because they keep updating it with some amazing things. It's there to help with your analysis to make it really friendly and helpful. And if you people generally are using a certain feature of it or want a certain feature, then they they add that in shouldn't think of R and R Studio as separate and it gets a bit tricky with language because I do this. I refer to R when I mean R Studio. The two things need to operate together. R Studio runs off R and it won't run off R, the program, but the program R can work on its own, which is why I said it's accessible for people, more accessible, so I've heard. Um, and that can stand alone, but it's it's very efficient and really pared down and you have to code everything. Our studio sits on top of it to make it more friendly. And the analogy came from Modern Dive. So there's a link there. So I'm going to open our studio to then give you a tour around and explain it a little bit more as well with its accessibility features. Now, just to reiterate again, our studio opens a session underneath and you don't have to open them both at the same time. You just have to have them both on your computer, both R and our studio as programs. But on the cloud, which I'm just resuming my project, which it timed out while I was talking, it should all be loaded with all of the packages and all of the documents. While that's loading, I just want to check with everybody who's got set up on their own computer, and you can put this in the chat. Have you got all the files and programs set up? Not programs, packages, or the, did, you, did you follow, did you get a chance to follow the pre-work sessions? If not, then I can just make sure that I cover that as we go through because there's just code you can run and it should do it for you. I've got one yes, which is going, no. Oh, one yes, one no, no. So a few people haven't got those bits. That's fine. 
I will make sure I've got the code available to share with you. So I'm going to my website and the pre-work. So I will just share this in the chat so that you can go to the pre-work while I'm chatting, but I will cover it as we go along. So those that went into the cloud, when I first opened this at the beginning of this session, there were only two panels to it. So they had all of this R version writing on the left and on the right, I think it looked more like this section, but the entirety of the right side. The second time I've gone in, it's set out now and I've got three panels. These bits are called panels. So it may, it's, it's subtly changed its view. Um, but this is what represents is represented on the left side. So I will go through all the bits with the pre-work, but um, just to bear that in mind, what you might have if you've got all of the files set up or if you're on the cloud is all of this kind of file structure in the bottom right hand corner under files tab rather than packages tab, which looks different. And you'll have things like HTML that you might recognize, CSV files, folders, that kind of thing. But if you haven't done that pre-work bit, don't worry, it might be blank. It will be blank. It might not be blank, actually, thinking about it. I'm trying to think of on your own computer. It might not look blank, actually. So this section on the left is the console. And this actually is R, the R program underneath. So as I said, every time you open up R Studio, you get an R session. And this is what it looks like if you were also to open up R as the program. You have um, a flashing cursor on a command line. Um, if you're familiar with any programming languages, that's that's there. It's sort of like where you can type in and you can use it like a calculator. So quite a powerful one. I'm going to do pi times two so just as an example. And um, if you didn't already know, it's 6.28, blah, 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 goes on for a lot. And if I do 37 divided by 12, it's really a glorified calculator, like a very powerful calculator and I have used it like that. Um, I think my daughter asked me a question once when I was working on my R Studio, and um, I just typed it into the command line and um, console command line and got the answer. There is a better way, though. And for people who are familiar with scripted languages like Python or SQL, you might wish to write it in a script that you can then save. And you can't save these commands down here. They just run and then they're, that's it. You, you can retrieve them. Actually, just if anybody's interested on command line, if you do the arrow key, if you have your cursor on there, you can flip through the previous commands. But that's not going to be great when you write lots and lots of code. So you're looking to have a script and a good way of doing that. Well, there's several good way. There are several ways to do this. And I will say this repeatedly because it's very much like Microsoft products. There's not one way of doing things in our studio. And it can be, I can kind of bombard people with, you can do it this way with your keyboard shortcuts and you can do your mouse. The point being that there's many different ways and it's nice to share those with you because you may choose which one suits you the best. I don't really want to say using your mouse is the best way because it's not for everybody. Actually, I'm not very good with mice at all. So the first way would be to go to file, new file in the drop down menu, and then you get the longer file list afterwards. And as you can see, I'm really bad at that, navigating my mouse. Starts with the R script at the top and it gives you the shortcut key. Quarto's new in that list now because this R Studio is up to date. Now, if you don't have that listed, don't worry. It may be that if you're on your own computer, you might not have a version that has been updated with that information. And it has lots of other information files, I should say, not information. I'm not going to do that because I'm really bad at that. Underneath, there is another icon, which is a page with a green circle over it with a white cross. If you click on it, even the I think if you click on it or even the arrow to the right, it gives you a shorter menu, which is what I was trying to navigate to. And that's the same menu with all the information. Also, I like using keyboard shortcuts a lot. And on your own computer, it's Control, Shift and N for November for opening a new script. But on the cloud, because you're not in our studio, you're in, I'm in Edge, I think. No, I'm not, I'm in Chrome. It's Control, Shift, Alt and N and it opens up a new editor screen. The reason why it's got this extra bit is because it opens up incognito, which I didn't realize. So the browser has its own shortcut keys. So there's a number of ways of finding. What we're trying to do is get this bit where it says untitled at the top, a little page with a blue circle and white R on it, which is for an R script and it's just blank. That's in the editor area and it's called a script. 
you need to link to the space. Um, I do, but um, is anybody from NHSR community here? No, NHSR is not here. Farai, did you have a link to the workspace? Could you find that to share? Okay, thank you. I'll share the link on the chat. Oh, somebody shared it, I think. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. It's just, it's a specific link. I didn't really want to put it out publicly and it doesn't get shared publicly because it can be using it because it uses up, we pay for the RAM to be used. But it's been shared by a couple of people. That's wonderful. Although I'm not sure the second link, it might go to the spaces. Oh, it does. I think, yes, it's got, it's a long URL. So hopefully that will get you. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate that. So where was I? Covering editor at the top, console at the bottom. Everything that you write in the editor and run goes to the console. So if I write P, well, let me do a different one. Um, trying to think of a sum. Let's do PI times 32. And I'm going to run it by clicking on this button, which is um, a white square. It's supposed to be a page, isn't it? With an arrow, a green arrow to the right to run it. It helps if I'm actually on it. It doesn't help, help if I'm on it. You can see at the bottom, it now says PI times 32, which is what I wrote as the code. And underneath it has the answer. Now, what's interesting in the console, just because if you're familiar and like using shortcut keys as I do, Microsoft particularly uses things like control Z for undo. So if I do control Z while I'm in this section in the editor, it undoes sections as I write it. But to redo, which I didn't realize how much I used until it disappeared is not control Y as you'd expect if that's a familiar shortcut to you, it's control shift and Z to redo. Apologies if that's not something you even use, but it, it changed my whole way of working at the beginning of using R because I had to work so I'd never have to redo. And that was quite intensive because for a long time, if I go to tools and keyboard shortcuts help, there's a shortcut key for that. You can see all of the shortcut keys that you can use. And there's a lot. And it used to say control Y. I don't know if it still does, which is what was really frustrating because I couldn't redo because it was broken. I'm not sure why it isn't that, but never mind. You can't quite see, and we will change this color definition, but there are different colors in the editor, not in the console. Oops, that's the wrong one. Um, P, pi here and the asterisk for multiplication are both black, and the number 32 is blue on this white background. You will see that a bit more clearly when I change the color and make it dark mode. And when you need to run some code, you can be anywhere on the line. You don't have to highlight the entirety. Now, if you're from a SQL background, you, you might be more comfortable doing that. Excuse me. But I quite like that you can have several um, things. If I do 37 times or divided by 12 and then run that one, I'm just on the line. I'm going to do control and enter, which is the keyboard shortcut, which I prefer. But it's the same as this white square with the arrow to the right. If I run that, it doesn't run the pi line one first. It just runs line three. Is that OK? Because you should be able to just use that bit for the moment without having the workspace with all of the things loaded. You don't need that at the moment. To continue with this, um, particularly if you're from a scripted language background, I suppose you might even do this for some other uh, tools, is do comments, which you don't want to run in your code. So uh, you can write just one hash. And if I write this is a comment, you can see it's changed color to green. And it means that even if I do control and enter to run it or click on this um, icon again with the arrow to the right, the green arrow to the right, it runs a line at the bottom of the console, but it's blank. So it, you can write your comments about your code. It says in the slide comment frequently, at least in the beginning. I think it it's a really useful thing. So even when you're when you're first starting, you might wish to say, I'm doing this because this will do that. And that's absolutely fine because as you're learning, you're talking to your future self. And I certainly still do this. 
uh, I'll forget what I've done. Comments are really good when you're sharing it with other people, why you're doing certain bits or when you're doing it. And comments are just really, really helpful. Documentation, really, this is what you're doing. So really encourage comments and do as much as you can or want to. I don't think there's too much. You will pare it down over time and be a bit more succinct, but it takes practice. So go ahead and comment. Are there any questions? Everything seems to be fine so far. Right, yo, particularly with the cloud. <laughs> so changing some of the settings to make it more accessible, more um, friendly, more comfortable for you. And there's lots of other things in there. If you go to tools, there's a long, long list, no, it's not a short list of options. We already looked at keyboard shortcuts help to give you an idea. You can modify your keyboard shortcuts. So if you have one from a previous area that doesn't exist or it's the wrong one, you can modify it. And what we're going to look at is not project options because that's specific to the project. And I will explain what projects are later. You're going for global options. So that's always your um, your R Studio, when you open it, is for all of your work, wherever it is. And even if you close it down, when you open it again, that kind of globalness, globality. <laughs> I think I made up a new word. That's really good. Now, this particular slide is to highlight this point about workspace, the restored R dot, dot R data, sorry, into the workspace at setup, startup. The recommendation is always to untick it but it's really dependent on what you want to do. So you can always have it as always, never or ask. I'll explain what it is, but it's just to say that our studio always gives you this kind of flexibility of what you want. Um, what we're doing here is switching off your, so when you close your system, if you have this ticked and open it up again, everything will be as you left it. And that may be what you want, but the problem with that is, and I've done this, I've created some code, done some work in it, created some, um, say, tables, some, well, we're going to call them data frames in R, but I'll explain that a bit later. Done lots of work, deleted a few lines of code. So if I tried to run it again, it would never run, but I've still got them remaining when I open up my own session. You then pass that code onto somebody else and they can't replicate what you've done because you've been relying upon something that no longer has any sort of definition to why it exists. It only exists in your computer now. So you untick this so that when you restore your workspace at startup, I, I think you might have to do a refresh even with this um, when, once you've clicked it. So if I do apply, I'll still have to refresh for it to work. When you close your session or move out of it, not so much on the cloud though, so you have to be careful of that if you're using the cloud. You have to force a restart, I think. Um, everything still remains. So all the things you've created, all the things that you've loaded, they'll all still be there. If you untick it, sorry, everything will be back. So it'll be like you've started afresh, which is a really good practice to get into so that when you run your code, it does it afresh. And if you've missed something, deleted something, changed something, which is really, really easy to do. I've done it so many times. That's why I'm giggling because I still do it now. Um, it means that you can you're just starting your fresh and you can find those bugs before they've even kind of been shared with anybody else. It's a bit strange that it's not default to untick it all the time. So I looked into it, which is why I found a link to why it wasn't default. And I think essentially what's happened, as we do in our own analysis, is you do something and you don't necessarily realise the consequences of it. So it had it ticked and it's been there so long, it would be confusing necessarily to sort of untick it. And there's a few other things like that with the work that we're going to go through today in terms of R that it starts, people, well, we just don't know what the future will hold. You, you'll create something and think, oh, it's just a one off. And actually then it becomes a massive repeated task and you just didn't anticipate that. And I think this is what has happened, particularly in this area. Another area that is really useful to look at, though, is appearance. So that's actually on my, on the, uh, on the cloud side, it's the fourth one down, whereas on the slide, it's the third one down. But you might have, because this was done, I think I took the screenshot on an older version of our studio. You'll have general code console and appearance, and it's appearance that you're looking to use. In there, you can have these options of changing the theme, which I think is like the skin, as you'd call it, the outline of your R Studio. I'm not going to touch those. I don't really change those very much, but I'm going to change my font size to make it 12, to make it bigger on my screen, as you can see, 
it should be a bit clearer, particularly if you're using a couple of screens. And I'm going to show you tomorrow night, which I quite like, which is a dark screen with colour on it. I like that. Other people do, but if anybody finds it difficult to view, please do let me know in the chat and I can change that to another setting. I really want everybody to be able to see this. Um, and if you can't, that's absolutely fine. So just let me know. There are other options as well. There's quite a few. I wanted to show a few for SQL people. So what SQL Server format does is it shows, it highlights your functions in blue, which is familiar. And um, when you write your strings, they're in red, for example, and your, is that right? Yeah, your comments are in green. I think they still are if you use something like SSMS. Another one that I quite like is Solarized Light. I forgot the one it was, which is a yellow background with the same kind of code on top. And that's, I use that in my SSMS. Uh, so I use it in a different program and that can be quite useful for some people, particularly with dyslexia. But I find it takes away that harshness of the white background. So I, I do like that and I benefit from those available. So I'm going to go for tomorrow night. I'm going to go for dark mode. And as I say, if it becomes difficult, even if you think at first, oh, that's OK, and it becomes a bit difficult to view, please let me know and I can change it. And it's a bit bigger on my screen. It's 12 in these sections. <coughs> Right, now I have a little break, um, but I'm gonna still keep talking. Sorry, <laughs> that was a very micro break. We will have a break in a bit. Packages, so you might have already heard about this. If you've gone through the pre-work, you will have tried to load that. Some people needed that. I'm gonna look for the packages, um, look for the code, and I would like you to I'll put that into the code. So that's all I've asked people to do. So if you're on your own computer, I'm just going to share with you the code to install packages. And I actually will type this in as well. But Tidyverse takes a bit of time to install, and I'll explain why. But if you could just put that into your console as I talk now, then it should be ready by the time I've finished, hopefully. You never really know, but we'll give it a go. So packages, if I make this bigger, oops, did it again. <laughs> um, packages are like apps for your phone. They extend the capabilities of base R, which I referred to before with the R detail. Um, is it like the R word kind of gets changed interchangeably between the program. It often means base R. It's a bit awkward because it can mean both. And it extends that raw code capability with functions and data sets and documents. So all that kind of work in your package. So the documentation as to what the package does, why it does it, how to get the best out of it, for example. Um, I'm just trying to close something off my screen. That might be better. Right. So the, taking that mobile phone analogy a bit further, you download your apps often onto your phone. You do that once and then you open the app when you require it. So you download once, open repeatedly. It's not always open, some things are, but on the whole, most things are not open. And R does that in the same way. You download your packages once, and you open them for each of the scripts that you require, each of the projects that you work in. The thing to bear in mind if you're on a network system, which is quite a lot of us are from the NHS or from neighboring kind of organizations, is that it goes to your private folder. So if you if you download a package, only you will see that package. Your colleagues will not necessarily see that. If they use the same computer as yours, not your same account, because you're not supposed to do that. But if you have a computer that different people log into, they'll only see their own area. So that could be a bit of a com complicating factor, depending on how your IT is set up. It means that if you're using a package, they will also have to do that. And we will show the install packages is the function code to do that. Now, I've put that in the chat already, um, but I'm going to kind of go through it as well here on this slide. So the nice thing, well, it's kind of nice. I kind of use it interchangeably in R. You can use single quotes or double quotes. It's agnostic to it. Unlike in SQL, for those SQL users, a single quotation is what you require, and it won't ever allow a double quotation. I must say, and I should say it repeatedly, I hope, is that whilst it's agnostic to quotations, it's not agnostic to mixed case. So if you are from SQL or Excel, particularly, you can mix your cases and it doesn't matter. It will still just read it nicely. That's not the case for R. 
it's very particular. So if you have, for example, um, categories like male and female and not known, if they, some of them have little, little characters, lower characters, or lower characters, and some of them have capitalization, there'll be distinct categories and they will count them differently in R. When you install your packages, you do that once, which is what I shared in the chat. And when you load it, it doesn't necessarily need, and I think from memory, I think you can put quotations around it because it's gone very, very flexible. I'm just going to try that. Control and enter, and it will load. Yeah, so it doesn't have to have the quotations and it can do, it's quite flexible now, which is a bit confusing. It used to be quotations for installation, no quotations for loading. Now it's kind of between the two, it doesn't really matter. Possibly because so many people use it, they've just coded it, so it's okay in our studio maybe. I'm just pausing because I don't think that's true. I think that might be R that does it. Anyway, it tells R to load the package into your script so it's available to use and you'll need it for every session and what we tend to do is if I get rid of these is always put them to the top it's kind of convention that you'll see what packages are being used within your script at the very top so even if you start using something halfway down it's always good practice to put it at the top so that you can see it a nice feature for um, R studio the latest version or latest versions is that if you have a script from somebody else that refers to various packages that you don't have loaded you'll probably get this bar that comes up it, it hasn't happened on this because they are already loaded saying these packages are not loaded do you want to install them now so that's our studio giving you a nice prompt and you just click the button and it installs it for you using this code that you would have done if you knew about it if that makes sense so you get a nice prompt to say do you want this this is being referred to would you like to load it? So that's nice, a nice addition. Where you get these packages from can be quite confusing as well because it's various places. They're all hosted on GitHub, that's the main location, but some of them come through places like CRAN, which you may have heard of. I always have to look at what it stands for, Comprehensive R Archive Network. And although the, it said 18, nearly 19,000 packages just in April, I'm sure there's many, many more. Every package that goes through CRAN has a check for how the documentation and the system, the package is built really, not the content. So if you have a function in there that does a statistical test and that test is wrong, it won't be testing that with your peer review. It will be testing how does it work, not what is the content. So they're all checked for the documentation, that the functions work, that it runs on various machines. So it has that standardized system about it which is very nice some organizations and it systems block you from installing it from anywhere else other than cran which is a bit of a problem because there are some packages that are in development or just not appropriate to go onto cran um, and are only available from people's github so there'll be things like things that need to be changed updated repeatedly like things with data we can't put them onto cran because that's annoying really to the CRAN people to constantly update something. They like to have things updated only once a year, let's say. Not, I'm not saying a time scale. Once in a blue moon was the thing I had in my head. So very infrequently and you will get blocked from putting things onto CRAN like every week or something. They won't like that at all. So an example is the NHSR theme which is an NHSR community package which is a small package with just themed colours and layouts and things and that's on our GitHub it's not on CRAN. It could go on to CRAN, but that takes a bit more work and nobody has quite had the time or, well, it's really the time really to be able to get that onto CRAN. So that would not be available if your IT says, no, you can only get CRAN. And another very important area is R OpenSci, which is for R Open Science. So it's a another peer review area, but um, it's called a ecosystem of R packages. And a particularly useful one there is fingertips R, which if you're using public health data, it's like an API feed of the fingertips portal that you might be familiar with on the website, giving you things like deprivation information, smoking prevalence and alcohol, all that kind of useful, great information that we should all be using, but it's only available through R OpenSci and GitHub, not CRAN. So just bear that in mind if you have an IT system that's super um, strict. But today we're going to use Tidyverse, which is on CRAN. And the interesting thing about Tidyverse, when we loaded it here, is that it's a package of packages. So it's a 
an ecosystem in itself. And when you down, well, download it and you install it, no, it's the other way around. Yep, no, install, <laughs> download and load, you get all the packages that are part of it loaded into your system, which can take a little bit longer because it's more packages than individually called. But it can be really useful so that you just get started. It provides lots of simple um, tools to then build together to solve complex problems, and they all follow the same underlying principles. The nice thing about it, if something changes in one of those packages, because it's tidyverse, they'll ensure that it doesn't have a uh, detrimental effect or it works with the other packages. They just all work together, which is lovely. So we're going to use over these two days, these two half days, ggplot2, dplyr, and redar, which are three packages. One is for, um, well, the first one, ggplot2, is for visualizations and charts. dplyr is for data manipulation, and redar is for reading CSV files into your um, R Studio sessions and R sessions. I've written it already and I've run it. I did library tidyverse into my code and then I ran it. I'm going to do it again, control and enter. And you can see there have been two things that have cropped up. I had one line where I had lots of information, which looked like on the left, and you might get these things like warning messages at the bottom. I didn't on the cloud because it's nice and up to date. And then the second time I ran it, I didn't get that information again. So just to point out, when you first load some uh, tidyverse, it gives you all the information. And if you've done it already, it doesn't repeat itself. It just says, oh, it's already there. Just load it again. And I've not done anything bad by doing that. You can load your packages repeatedly and it, it just loads them. It's fine. You get a lot of information in here. And just to talk about it. So the one on the left, which is the screenshot, is a bit out of date. So some of the numbers have changed. So the packages have been updated since. So ggplot2 on that version is 3.3.3. .3 and on my right one, it says 3.3.5. So there'll be minor changes. I'm a person who likes to have up-to-date packages. This is on the cloud, so that's why it's all up-to-date. But some other ways of working within your team is sometimes just to stay on one version so that it all works. And I think in the early days when you're first learning R, you don't have to worry too much about it. It's just think just to be aware that things change in packages and new things come in and it may be that new information may be required like for example pivoting was a very important thing it's called one thing previously and now it's got a new function detail but tidyverse people which is our studio behind it try to work through to um, explain these functions quite clearly as they come out and also give hints in the documentation in the packages to help you work out which ones you should use. Before we go down that route, uh, I just want to say these are all the packages that have been loaded, lots of ticks against them, the versions that they are. And underneath where it says conflicts, this isn't saying that there's a bad thing. It's to warn you that if you are using dplyr, which is what we will do tomorrow on data manipulation, and also a stats package called stats, they have they share the function filter. They do different things, but because dplyr is so much more commonly used than the stats package, it will always use the filter. Likewise, it will always use lag. So if people are SQL users and have used lead and lag, they're similar functions, it will default to lag as opposed to the stats lag. And if you wanted the stats package lag as opposed to the dplyr one, they use this uh, sort of pathway listing for your function. And I will later discuss functions Well, at the end of this session today. The stats is the package part, colon, colon, and then your function. So it's a bit like a pathway for your fun for your packages to say this is this is the exact one I want to use. And you might see that written out in some places where you look for people's code. They might do that where they write it all out in full as their standard. And that's the end of that session. Quite a lot of information on R and R Studio. It's probably a good time to check to see how people have got on with packages at least set up. And we're going to go into course materials. So if you haven't managed to do so, you possibly need to do, I'll write it in the um, chat. This is a bit strange because the chat doesn't give me feedback. I want you to, oh, it's not there. I'll just give you this code here which will install a package called use this onto your computer and that's on CRAN. And then you're using that, as I said before, just to explain to people, that's the package name, colon, colon is to say, 
you know, this is the pathway and then using a function to then bring through all of the CSV files and data files that we'll be using. Oh. And you'll see in your file structure here, if you're on the cloud and you can't see your information, or if it's more for people who are on their own computer. If you're on the cloud, can I just see if everybody can see all these files in the bottom right hand side? Just to make sure, because you, you could run this code as well, or you could use the link to the workspace. You can, that's brilliant. Great. Any other questions that have cropped up? Completely unrelated. Okay, no, that's fine. Yes, everyone can see them, brilliant. So I'm just going to cover this session about using projects and then we'll have a well-deserved break and then you can have a break from me talking constantly too. Projects um, is a really, really short chapter. And the reason why I'm sort of hesitating to tell you it's short, but please pay attention is because I had a, a wonderful colleague who did this course and then he was showing us some code as part of our code review. And I noticed that he was not using them. And I said, well, why are you not using projects? And it's really easy to blink and miss it probably shouldn't do it just before a tea break. I should probably do it after a tea break. But the project's logic of how things are done, if people are familiar maybe with workspaces, um, it's not really something I've ever really done with SQL. And when you're working in Excel, it is your workspace. It's your your area. So it's it's a bit strange like that. But essentially, if I just put it into the context of my own file structure, and the, the cloud isn't the best example really because the cloud uses projects. It forces you to do good practice in something called projects. So I'm just gonna try and open my own, my own desktop, which is opening as we speak, as I speak. I'm using that royal we. And you can see uh, in the bottom right hand corner, so this is my own computer, so you can see it's the dark mode as well. Lots of files, it's quite messy. I do try to have some sort of function of tables there, but uh, of folder structure, but it's quite tricky to find things for me. I, I find it really cognitively difficult to find my file structure. If I just push that over to that side, no, that side. Oops. If you're trying to find out where your default area is. So if you saved something and you're like, well, where did that save? Uh, you know, I've just, we will do some saving later in today on your own computer, not on the cloud because the cloud will only ever do it in a project. If you look at this top part under the console, it can tell you my version of R, which is R 4.2.1. But the interesting point is where this tilde is and the forward slash and an arrow. So that is my working directory. You may have seen some code, you shouldn't use it, but I will write it nevertheless, set WD, set working directory. And what you can do is sort of bookmark, this, this is bad practice. You go to the folder that you're looking at and when you're working with and you set your working directory when you're in it. That's really tricky because you might set your working directory to some folder that nobody else has access to, just you, your own personal folder. And you can't share that so easily because people need to reconstruct that folder structure layout to then put the data and it, it just becomes very messy in terms of collaboration. So what we're doing with project setup is saying this is all the information and the data and uh, code and here's the bookmark already pre done with it and you've got this nice bookmark. If I click on this arrow, um, well actually what I'm going to do first of all is go into some random folders. I'm going to go to data hazards. And um, now you can see I'm in a folder structure that says home, GitHub, data hazards. And if I want to go back to my home directory, as it's called, I can click on the arrow, which is flashed to the right, and it will take me back to my working directory, which is set as my C drive. But as you can see, I've got folders within folders within folders, and I might not really want my C drive. I don't want it all to be in there. It's messy as it is. I don't really need anything more in there. So if, I, if I'm if i thinking about where I've gone with this NHSR, that would be helpful. Uh, maybe I haven't done it in there. I'm just trying to work out my folders. And I called it workshop, workshop R. So this is a workshop hyphen R, which follows this context. So I want this to be my working directory. 
I don't want this at the top of my console on the left where it says take it to my home directory. I want this project directory. And so what I can do is click on, let me see, my screen's a bit squished. I don't think it's browsing yet. Maybe I shouldn't do the browse yet. I can create a project and I tend to use this shortcut button up here. Um, there are, you can do it in, I think, file, new project, dot, 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 but that uses a mouse and I'm pretty poor at that. So I use the shortcut menu here, which says project none. So every time I open up my R Studio, I don't have a project that I'm in. And I can, you can see my old, I've got quite a lot there. You get your top 10 recently viewed, like you do when you go into a Microsoft product, your recently viewed um, projects and you can create a new project, dot, dot, dot. I'm gonna do that for the moment. And just to remind people, this only works on your own computer. On the cloud, you're in a project already. And when you're in one, you can't navigate to create a new project. The whole concept is just forced good practice. Whereas when you're on your own computer, you've got the flexibility of not bothering with them at all. When you do a new directory for projects, that means I want a new folder. I'm going to create it all new, get the folder and put my bookmark in it. But I've already got all my data when I went to that workshop R folder. I'm going to go to the existing directory and I'm then going to navigate the, the tilde is or squiggle is my C drive. I want to now go to just to highlight this is not Explorer because it's in R Studio, but it looks like Windows Explorer, which is nice and friendly and uh, familiar. I go to workshop R and then open. So I've told it where I want it and I can create a project in there. Now, when I'm creating a project, what it's doing is putting in a bookmark and that bookmark is called the same name as the, the folder, which is nice. You can change that. That's fine. But it's just nice that it matches it. So it's called workshop hyphen R dot R proj. And that's essentially your bookmark. And now you can see up in the top right hand corner, this drop down menu where I've got workshop R. So I can go to NHSR data sets now on that drop down menu and it just flips it to the new area and then I can go back. So it changes all my file structures at the bottom and up here I've changed my working directory with my arrow. Just, it takes away so much of that confusion, well for me anyway, trying to navigate where all my folders are. And then I've gone back to the workshop R so it's changed up here at the top. And also just so that you know, this little um, shield appears when you have a project uh, bookmark, as I'm starting to call it a bit more now, it matches. So if I navigate it into, ooh, let me just see, if I navigate to a completely different folder, confusingly, book down, I'm now in book down and I want to go back to my workshop R, but I didn't really remember that there was an arrow to the right. There's always more than one way of doing it. I can click on the shield and that shield takes me back to workshop R. Just helps you navigate and there's a bit more navigation, which is what I missed out on this side before, in this area with your files in the bottom right hand side of your computer screen. Next to the shield saying R, there's three dots. If you click on the three dots, it means you can navigate now as if you're in Windows Explorer, but just to remind you again, this is all in our studio and you can search for folders and files. And, you know, say if I was in that folder for the workshop and I want to go and find um, a data set, let's say from NHSR data sets, I've got that listed. If I look at data, I don't have anything in there. Let me just see if I've got something. Oh, I need to open up data. Sorry. It opens the folder and now I can see the files in that folder and then open something. So I use that a lot. You can also in this area, just so that you know, is it's a bit squashed. If I extend it, you can see the, the symbol and the name, whereas when it was all squashed, you could just see the symbol. You can highlight these details, delete them, rename them in the drop down cog option you can copy, copy to. So these are kind of options that you would get if you're in Windows Explorer. So you can do quite a lot within our studio about file management, which is quite nice. And I'm going to go back to my arrow by clicking on the workshop hyphen R forward slash and then the arrow to the right to go back to all those files, 
on my own computer and just finish off with this nice picture from Alison Horse, who is the resident artist and has done a lot of kind of cartoon imagery and drawings for our studio in terms of statistics and some of the um, functions in our dplyr and ggplot and other other packages that they maintain so this particular thing for the the projects for me really helps with organization i use it for the smallest things because navigating can be so complex for me not in the cloud because as i keep trying to say you can't navigate in the same way because you're in a project what you can navigate between other versions which i didn't realize to to navigate your projects you have to come out of your project area i won't do that because that's all about the cloud it does reduce cognitive load and it also helps when you're sharing your information because if you do set working directory just to sort of like go over that again you're telling your code you have to go into the right place manually and then set your code. And I suppose what projects appeals to me is that it's already kind of pre-coded. You've already done your bookmark in the area and then you can navigate from the outside in. Is that OK? I find it really difficult to explain not using projects now because I've used it so long. So if you have any questions at all, it would really help me focus my mind on explaining projects. Everybody seems OK. I hope that's a good thing with silence. So summarize our studio projects. Hard to explain, but they do they do make it really simple to switch between your projects. I do that all the time. Organizing your workflow and sharing is the ultimate kind of goal in this as well. Well, actually, for me, the ultimate goal is organization because it's so hard for me. I really struggle. So trying to explain what it was like without is just a mess <laughs> and when you're trying to share with other people to get their help it's a lot easier oh i've done the project already so oh i was ahead of myself eek sorry so i will just go through it again if that helps if i can find my own computer there so i went into this i do all the navigation in terms of projects in this area so you can open in a new session as well, open your project. And this was just saying that if you go to file, new projects, that's actually in the top menu, you get the wizard menu. And you can create a new one or existing directory. Oh, I'm going backwards in time. I think I've done that again and I've gone through. Yeah, I kind of went ahead of myself in a roundabout fashion. Was that okay? I think we could do with a break. I could definitely do with a tea break. So it's uh, 10.44. So if we have 10 minutes for a tea break. So if I put in the chat, come back at 10.54. Um, we'll have a little bit of a break. And I will pause if I can get this to work. Let's do pause. Yeah, so welcome back everyone. I am not showing my screen, so I'll just share my screen. Let's do that. And I opened up here, actually, NHSR Slack. So I'm gonna share with everybody the sharing link. So you're welcome to come along and it should just get you straight into NHSR Slack. I've opened it on the channel. I've got everything open. So you might not see that necessarily. You might come into general, I think, when you come in, but there's help with our it's just a very friendly channel for any questions at all relating to R, but people post questions sometimes in random or even Conference 22, which we've got for this NHSR conference this year. And it's a very friendly area. We have an upgrade subscription thing here, so things don't get kept over many, many years. So some of these, um, uh, what do they call them, channels don't have anything in them because they were used a while ago and so they're kind of just they just we don't keep the records but just bear that in mind but i will talk about more help in the future oops just a second i would like to go into importing de there's a glitch error getting a glitch error where are you getting a glitch error for the link above oh are you which website are you using which browser are you using edge okay um 
give me a second with that one unless anybody else can sort of use that i don't know that's the thing i got from the slack group to join works uh, i wonder if there's something on the yeah i wasn't sure if it was the link or if there's something on the um the system edge and chrome okay right we might have to just do some sort of work with that elsewhere i think it's always a technology issue when it comes to the browsers or the cloud and things like that so uh, i will kind of keep with the course though but we will try and get you on at some point let's say with nhsr slack importing data is the next part that we will do i'm going to close that because that's my own computer i'm back onto the cloud on the right point being blocked Oh, yes, of course, Slack may not be available to everybody. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. So if you're on your VPN, your virtual private network with um, a public sector organization or maybe some other organization, it may be that you have stricter security or even on your own home Wi-Fi, for example, it might have some security that's been set up. So it may be Slack that's being blocked. Good point. So importing data. Um, there are packages. Oh, I did mention this at the beginning. No matter what you use, you there'll be a package out there. So with Excel, um, there's a lot of uh, work. What, I forget the names of the Excel things. So there's XLSX and XLS, but then there's a new workbook function as well. So, um, sorry, I got a call. Very strange. Um, a workbook system and there's a new package for that so i've not used that successfully myself but if you're using some of the really more advanced excel workbooks then maybe there'll be something out there for you to use as well <laughs> everything seems to be going technologically all over the place here so what we're going to do now though is install something that's quite common to using r which is using csv files because they're one of the simplest ways of getting your data between your programs and we're going to use the read R, which is this particular one that's already loaded because I use library tidyverse. And we're going to try and get this particular, oh, I, I can't do it in um, alphabetical order, this CSV file called capacity underscore AE. And we're going, we could do it from scratch as it says on the, uh, what's it called, slide. And you might have got that code from somebody else to do that. Um, but it's often easier to get it with the import wizard. It just it's also a nice friendly way of seeing step by step what occurs when you do this so the import data set i'm just looking for it on the cloud import it just says it doesn't say import data set i think it's because it's all squashed ah if i give it a bit more space it says import data set so it's this kind of like grid one grid image with a um an arrow to the right green arrow to the right and on if you click on that you get a very short drop down menu with things that are already kind of built in in a sense our studio will load the package for you install i suppose if it's not there already i think that's what happens and so that's from text which are the common ones with csv excel spss sas and stata but it's not limited to that it's just what's sort of built into our studio in its references so we're going to use from text read our dot 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 and dot 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 if you're not already familiar with it often refers to the fact that there'll be a wizard that pops up happens quite a lot with microsoft products we get this view which is now replicated on both sides where we get this import wizard but we're not showing any data because we haven't said what file to import and you can browse for your file dot 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 again it will give it another wizard and in this particular project, so if you've got all the files and you've got you're, you're in that as your working directory, either using it as a project or set working directory, which you should not do, but you've done it, hopefully using projects, um, you'll see this these options and you can navigate to them. This is a cloud, so you're restricted just to this project. But if you're on your own computer, you can navigate across networks and all sorts of files, folders and file structures. I was trying to merge the two words together. That was, that was quite a feat of achievement. We're looking for capacity underscore a dot CSV and um, you can click open or you can double click it and it says retrieving data and it's it's reasonably fast. It's a bit squished because I've I'm taking up two things on my screen. And it says we can well, it says we do not want to do that at the moment because I just want to explore a few parts of this. So you could go to import and just do it straight away, but it's good in this occasion anyway, just to highlight you've got a code preview 
which you can highlight sections of and copy. I'm going to take just this middle line and I'm going to use control C for copy, the shortcut key that you might be familiar with when you use Microsoft products as well. We don't need library read R because it's already been loaded when I did library tidyverse and I'm not going to use view at the moment, which is just code to say open this up. You can use this little notebook notepad fun, uh, icon as well. And if I did that, it would sort of clipboard all three lines of code. I think that might be the next slide. Yeah, it is. And just to give you this kind of reference, you either take the three lines of code using the clipboard or you can just copy one line of code, which is what I'm going to do. I'm going to click cancel. I'm going to give myself a bit more room. Control V to paste it, or you can use right click and then paste or paste as plain text, it doesn't matter. And so you get this code which has come from the wizard. What I really like about RStudio is, and R, I guess, generally, RStudio predominantly, is a lot of the actions that you take with your mouse and clicking has a consequential code um, detail behind it. Now, you might not always see that. Uh, it might not do that in the wizard, but you can find that often somebody else has coded it. So most things have got this link to it. I'm pretty sure if you're using Excel, that would be the same thing, but it's just not a scripted language. There's somebody here who uses VBA. It may be that VBA is like the closest way to sort of link it, that if you click this, this is what the code would look like. And it's much more accessible in, in terms of coding through RStudio, I found. So again, you can run this either by clicking on the button, which I wonder if I give it more space. It, yep, it's an icon and then it becomes a run next to it, which is nice. It's just I was squashing it. So it's a white square like a page with a green arrow to the right or somewhere in the line of code and then control and enter to run off your keyboard. You get this bit of information down here. So it throws the information to the code into the console to run in the R session gives you some output information and you might have noticed up here in the environment tab in the top right corner panel something has appeared called capacity underscore AE if I give it more space there we go you can see it's named as it is here and just so that we can sort of explore that because it comes to the end of the slides but we can see 68 rows five columns now that represents the same thing here where it says 68 observations and five variables. So variables are columns and observations are rows. This is kind of language that is more familiar. Observations and value va var variables are, it's our language that's used, but they mean rows and columns. It tells you a little bit like, ah, okay, somebody's got an error, but I'll just explain this first of all. The delimiter is a bit like when you've been importing to Excel, if you've ever done that, and it's using the comma to delimit, to, to, delimit, to delimit, to show the, the breakings of the kind of like the sections. Coming through as either a double, which are numbers, I think it's a double, and logical is like binary. But you're getting an error, um, could not find function read underscore CSV. You, possibly need to do library tidyverse if I put that into the chat and run that and if you still get an error could you let me know and I want to make sure that we get that sorted so if I go back and do introduction to ggplot2 I'm just getting ready but I just want to make sure that you get something and then it runs again while that person's sorting out that error bit, see if it works on that function error. I'm just going to point out that this is more artwork, lovely artwork from Alison Horse with these little friendly creatures talking about ggplot2 and building a masterpiece. Yeah, all okay, brilliant, that's great news. Thanks for letting me know. And we're going to cover, it feels, some people have commented this on this and I also feel it's a bit strange not doing the data manipulation first, but doing the chart visualizations. But I think what we're doing is following the R for data science book, which is written by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grohl. Let me see if I can open it. Let me get into that chapter. Let me see, let me go to the beginning. Welcome. Oh, does it not have the name of the person? I think, it, oh, there it said on the thing, sorry. 
I want to make sure I got the name of the person because I always, always, he's like, Garrett Grolmond. I was close. I was very close. And I think I might have hinted at that. So R for Data Science is available, as you've just seen, free online. You can buy it as a paper copy. As it gets updated, it's done as you, as, as it's kind of available, which is one of the nice things about R as well that I found that lots of the materials are free and you can buy them if you wanted to and have a paper version to have a uh, like a physical real book available for most bookshops which is really nice too and the format of that is to cover ggplot2 first I think so that you can see what you're coding because one of the difficult things is you write something and it works but you don't know what it's done but when you do visualizations you can see it work which is nice and then you later go through the data manipulation part which is the thing I've enjoyed the most because I came from a SQL background where that's where I did a lot of my work um, ggplot2 is not the only plotting package it feels like it sometimes because it's mentioned so much but this is a tweet from 2018 so it's a number of years ago but it's referring to base r and uh just base r really as an alternative now base r is really really quick for charts very small amount of code but a little bit harder to manipulate and by that by putting on titles and changing your act doing the nice things around ggplot not ggplot2 chart sorry i'm getting the words interchangeably in your charts making them look nicer and and doing things you can do that with base r but it is a bit harder and so ggplot2 is an extension of what base r plotting can do there is also plotly which is a package used extensively by public health england and that's an interactive plotting package now they use it i think this is right to say exclusively so they've written functions that use it um, they just code it directly in Plotly. But what you can do with your ggplot2, which is nice, is you can create your plot and then make it interactive by putting a Plotly function around it. Just one word and we'll discuss functions, but just brackets around it and then it becomes interactive. But Public Health Scotland have gone down the route of just using that. ggplot2 is very popular. You probably have heard about it even before you came to this course. It's well designed and supported because it's um, supported by our studio and it's supported in line with the other packages that interact with it, interrelate with it, like um, Dplyr, suddenly forgot the name. It's highly versatile. It's very, very powerful. The, the principles behind it, which are also used in Python, for example, is the principles this is. It's, um, oh, I just had the word and it's gone. It's, uh, no, nope, gone. It's about layering your, your chart information so you change your chart by layers and we will explain that I will go through those slides in a bit oh there's a there's a concept and I've forgotten the name completely I haven't drunk my tea and I think that's part of it it hasn't quite brought it back it'll probably come second to that and the graphics can be really really attractive and I'll show a couple of examples of some uh, kind of like familiar areas like BBC for example who use it and have um, they call it cookbooks in a sense like this is our style guide and you can take hints and tips from their style guide to help with your own plots there is um, the argument for and of course there is the argument against so not everybody likes ggplot2 or uses it this next slide is what I was hinting at with the BBC style graphics. I'll see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Oops. So you get little code snippets to it to how to do bits. I don't know why it scrolled down. Um, let me see if I can make this bigger. And you can these have been created in ggplot2. So I think the code might even be available, although that might be an image thinking about it, but you can then break it down. So this idea of putting words on your charts with an arrow to it really draws the eye. And it was something that John Byrne Murdoch from the Financial Times talked about at last year's uh, online NHSR conference, which was really interesting. So this is how uh, journalists try and highlight because people naturally are drawn to text. Interestingly, I found you'll look at the text before you read the rest of the chart. And the BBC visuals, they're all available there using um, ggplot2. There's also, I think it's The Economist, people have liked their charts. I don't think they necessarily use ggplot2, but people have tried to emulate those or recreate those charts and those colour formations and structures and text in ggplot2. So it's like you taking a chart that you're familiar with in the pro programme that you use, say if it was Excel, and then coding it so that it's in ggplot2 to try and match it. I have done that as well with my own charts. Right, enough with the 
lovely examples. They are lovely. But just to say, it just kind of reinforces, we put the library tidyverse at the top, which was already run because that's what I was doing, but just so that you've got that. And we're going to look at the project. Uh, it says perennial challenge. I always sort of pause at this point. Because, um, yeah, this was before the COVID period and pressures in A&E are even worse. So if anybody here is an A&E analyst or works in that data, yeah, this, this would be quite, this is very old data. So it's not going to be much different in terms of pressures. It, it's probably much worse. So we've loaded capacity underscore AE and we're showing the changes in capacity of the A&E departments from 2017 to 2018. So we're looking back in time. We get the data from NHS benchmarking network, but it has been cleaned and that means it's a bit easier to work with just to get you started. But um, most of the data that we get freely available through these areas are not so tidy and easy to use. But the object we're using, this is what we call an object in the environment area in the top right of the R studio, where it has this blue circle and white arrow to it is called an object. If you click on that, that blue circle, you'll see the columns that are in there and a bit more information underneath about what type they are. You can also see here the types, number, number, logical number, number. And if I give it a bit more space, you might see more space on yours. You get the kind of like highlighted version, but on a kind of horizontal rather than a vertical. So that could be quite good just to have a quick view of your data system. When I first started from SQL, so it's quite key that it, I was from a SQL background and maybe even from those who use Excel, I used to call these objects tables because that's what they are in relational database terms. But this is not a relational database. This is a programming tool. So these are called, uh, let me see, data frames specifically. There are other formats that you can have within R, which I don't always touch upon. You might hear if you do some other courses, matrices, vectors, lists, lists are very, very important. Um, but I've kind of avoided those for a long time. We will cover vectors just briefly because it does work within what we're at the context of what we're going to do with data manipulation tomorrow. But often we're looking at data frames. Tables are kind of referred to in a statistical format. Now, I don't think I've mentioned, I should have, R is a program language that came from statistics specifically. The program before it was S, which was a proprietary software, um, which then became R, which was the free version. And so it's it's got this history ongoing as well relationship with statistics. And when we use tables, they're the formatted things that go into reports or into statistical format, um, not in this context of data frames. So there's quite a lot of language to get used to, I found, and still feel between these areas of programming languages. The other thing that kind of comes up, is, comes up is this thing called tidy data. So I just want to reassure people who are from SQL backgrounds specifically, or if you've ever had any data from um, SQL, you, you might be more familiar with this, in that this feels like a new area, new word, but actually the concept may be quite familiar, actually, and I found it quite surprising. It was written about had, by Hadley Wickham, who is a statistician, works for R Studio and works heavily within R and has helped code dplyr and ggplot2 and written about it. But tidy data has each, it says each variable is a column. So we saw those two things referenced up here in the section here where it says observations and variables and down here it, it translates them into what we're more familiar with like rows and columns. And I suppose the thing for tidy data for me, just in the, the broadest sense of the word, is that what you might see in an Excel form, say if you're using patients, you might see one patient per row and all your wards are each column. Now that's wide data, that's human friendly data, and it's not very useful when it comes to doing charts or manipulating your data or statistics. What we tend to need, which comes from like the SQL relational database world too, is long data, tidy data where you have your patient repeated according to, so you have one column of wards and it'll be patient A is in column A, not column A, ward A and ward B and ward C. They'll be repeated. Much, much harder to read as a human because you have to scan down a lot more. It's, it's, we read left to right. It's not, it's not human friendly at all, but it is machine friendly. And that's what we're using within our nicely called tidy data. Just also to slip in another word, which you don't have to worry about too much. It's just something that you might hear, a tibble. Now, I think it's because 
I think, and I really should look into this. I say this a lot, but I should look into it. Hadley Wickham is from New Zealand originally. And I think when you say table in a New Zealand accent, it sounds a bit more like a tibble, table, tibble. And tibble is an extension of data frames, extensions of tables in that kind of looser form. It's, it has all the same functionality, but when you look at it in this console area, which we will do, it just makes it a bit easier. It gives you a bit more information about it than if it were just a pure form data frame. Don't worry about it too much at the moment. It's just, it might be something that you hear more about tibbles, data frames. Why do we have objects? Why do we have all these kind of like terms for things? Each thing has its own specific vocabulary. But let's look at the data frame. So there's, again, various options. There's not just one way of looking at it. I have actually skipped ahead as well. And I said, clicking, no, I said, click on the arrow. But if you click on capacity, the word, you get the code, which you may from, remember from the wizard, where it said view, goes down into the console. So a click relates to some code, which is run. And I can actually copy this if I need to put it back into my script, which makes it quite flexible to move it between the systems. And it opens up its own tab in the editor area. So you can see the full table. It's quite big. There are 68 entries, it says here. They call it entries there, which is interesting. A really useful feature of our studio is you've got these um, symbols just underneath where you've got your tab put for this particular thing because it's got data as well. The arrow means that you can flip between your tabs just back and forth a bit easier, more easily. You can filter as well, and I'll explain that a bit later in terms of the data you can see. But the arrow going up, out to the right, up and out it should be, and uh, kind of like a, a spreadsheet behind it, if you click on that, if you have your pop-ups available, if you're on your cloud, oops, I'm not sure if you saw that. That was my power. I should have checked my power. It pops it out to a new window, which is really nice if you've got multiple monitors. So you can put your data right next to your code and you can see them side by side. If you want it to go back and to appear as a tab, you click on the same position of um, symbol, which is between the filter and the arrows, and it's got the arrow going back down and in. You click on that and it takes it back. If you close it, it just removes it and then you might have to open it again. But it's just to highlight that that's how you get it back in. Right, option two to run gives you a different view. So if I write capacity underscore AE on line five, nothing else, just leave my cursor flashing at the end of it and then do control and enter, it opens up in the console. And because it's called a tibble, gives you information about how many rows and columns there are, information about what they are as well. So what kind of type of data? Mine's squashed again, squashy. Let's do that instead. And then it gives you the top 10. So if it were just a data frame, it would give you them all, which makes it really, really long, 68 rows of data. But a tibble just goes highlight top 10, which gives you a nice quick view. I didn't say, I don't think, I did control and enter to run it when I was on the, on the line, anywhere on the line. Now, before we go into the variable names, I just want to say, if you run this line again, the line three, where it says capacity underscore AE and you're reading in your file, it will just read it in again. And it will have no, it will just overwrite what you put in this section here, which is good. And just to reassure you that when you make any changes to your data in this area, like a temporary table, in a sense, if you're a SQL user, it has no effect on the underlying data that you've got that you've imported from. Oh, that's an interesting comment. I missed that one. Is it a random top 10 or is there an order? No, it's in order. Yeah, so it's not random. You can do random. That'd be a different function. But the thing is just the first first 10, I think you can see. You can see it's the first 10. It's exactly the same, but just a different view. It's a view, just a quick snapshot view. So do we understand the variable names? I will explain what they are. So site is just like a, an ID for the sites as opposed to names. Attendance 2018 and numbers of people. Staff increases binary, true, false, did they increase or did they not? And D cubicles and D weight, which are less obvious, are the differences in averages between the two years of 2017 and 2018. Difference in av average, dis difference in average between cubicles, uh, in cubicles and weight. 
This is a reinforcement slide with a nice picture from Alison Horse, which I think is, is really, it speaks to me because I didn't do this. The simple graph has brought more information to the data analyst mind than any other device. And I did not do that for a long, long time. I just worked with SQL data, manipulating it, tidying it, doing counts, and then eventually would do a, if I did a chart, it would be a final proof of product type thing. It would be for distribution chart rather than I'll just have a look at this data, see this distribution, see what I'm looking at, look at my numbers in a different way. And I have started doing that because I'm in R and I think it's a really weird psychological friction thing in that before I'd go from SQL to Excel and it was just like a step away, two different programs. And when you're doing it in Excel, there's a lot of clicking and dropping and you kind of, it's not always, is it? You can just sort of look at your chart to give it credit. It's just me. Um, I didn't look at my data. So when I've done it in R, I have done it a bit more where I'll just like throw in a couple of like histograms or look at this in the data, just have a look at it, see what it looks like, see the shape of your data, as they say. And that's been quite useful. And one example is when you're looking at ages of your patients, say, and you have a look at the ages and then suddenly you see that some people are less than zero age and people are into 200s because there's a coding error. Now, you could look for that in your data, but I didn't. So it was nice seeing it. And it gives you the shape as well. So you can see whether it's like really skewed towards the younger age groups or really towards the older or if it's a nice distribution, and depending on the service, depends on whether that's something that you think is correct or not. So if you're looking for older people services and everybody's under 18, you think I've got the wrong data here. That's a bit weird. Looking at your data can help. And R generally can make that a bit simpler and ggplot2 can it's a, it's, I'm not going to say that simple because actually that isn't. We'll go through these stages of how to build it, but it does produce some really nice uh, product charts at the very end of your coding. So is there a change is the question in the number of cubicles available in A&E associated with the change in length of attendance? And we're going to begin by calling a function called ggplot. And what ggplot does, ggplot, oops, if I run that, control and enter, it does a chart, but I haven't told it any data. It's just a function. I'm saying to ggplot2 specifically, that package, create a chart. The plus at the end, I didn't put that in because it would fail, but that's layering. But I will keep going and put data, tell it the data, and I'm going to write capacity underscore AE. And again, this is not going to step by step. It's not going to do anything. I've told it the data, but I've not told it lots of other things you'd expect in a chart like what kind of chart or if you're using a chart with axes x and y i've not said anything i've just said plot this do that and as you can see the code runs but it doesn't actually produce anything and what's changed is in the bottom right hand corner corner panel i've moved from the files tab to the plots tab and it's gray but we can layer it and these pluses keep adding layers to it. So if I add the plus, and I will explain this a lot more because this is new stuff that's coming in. You can see there are lots of these geoms and I've started with writing PO and I forgot to say actually, as I was typing, it has auto, I was gonna say autocorrect, but I don't think it's autocorrect, it's IntelliSense type thing, isn't it? It's, uh, I forgot what it's called now. There's another word for it. It's like IntelliSense, if you use SSMS, it kind of guesses what you're going to write next. So if I go back and do geom, I get all of these options for geom. And then I did unders underscore and p, a bit slower. And then I can choose and select which one I want, which is quite nice. So you don't have to type everything, and particularly if it's really long. I'm going to really rush through this because I'm going to go ex and explain in a second what we're doing. I'm writing AES brackets x equals d cubicles. And I'm going to go on to the next line because it gets squashed y equals d weight just so you can see the chart i'll give you the code so you can see a chart and then i'm going to explain what all these new bits are because it's a lot of code before i explain that what chart we've used i i, I there's this lovely picture from alison horse with pie charts you can do pie charts in r statisticians are hesitant often to use let's say pie charts i think they have a place but they're probably overused and not used correctly so it's nice that they kind of get this uh, I got the gig the choice of your chart is really important 
And so we've, I've, for these slides, it's just D on point to give dots, uh, but it could equally be something else, but possibly not pie charts. And just to explain, as we break down, like what is the concept of a chart? And this is, comes from the R for data science as well. There's a lot of decision-making around the charts, which you have a lot of um, influence over when you're coding it because you're, unlike, you're coding your chart from scratch, really unlike if you're getting it through Excel, which does a lot of it for you. You can manipulate it step by step. So you have reasonable defaults like we've got here, but you can change the shape of those data points, for example, like you have uh, round circles here, we can do it as square. And this choice, whether it's a circle, if it's default with circles, or if it's a square or some other shape, is the geom part of it. You're looking at the geometric object. So this is the geom in your code. And the next step would be the visual aesthetic attributes that we give to that geom point. And it can be size, we can change and manipulate the size, make them much bigger or much smaller. In this case, it's smaller. Or the position, I've not done this myself, but you can tweak it to horizontal, is that right? Yep, axes, x axes, or vertically on the y axis. And that's part of the AES aesthetic. So this is what AES is standing for, shortened version of aesthetic. And you can also change your color so you can make your points green and other colors. So there's a lot of manipulation that can occur in it. So what we're just sort of showing here is geom for geometric. And on this occasion, we're using point and AES, which is aesthetic. But in this code that I shared with you in the chat as well, it's all default. So it's just you can see these charts sometimes where you've got this background where it's got the white lines in the background and it's gray and the color formations. Stopping as well also to point out, there's a lot of variation, not variation, there's a lot of code in here, there's a lot of functions. And functions are often denoted by these brackets. And brackets in ggplot2 are my nemesis because there's a lot of them and the position of them can change. And you, know, you can forget one, put them in the wrong place and, and that's my nemesis in this. Sometimes it's commas, but in ggplot2 for me, it's these Brackets. So there's a couple of things you can do to sort of make it a bit easier on your eye, maybe. Um, if you wiggle your cursor around a bracket, you can see the corresponding bracket highlighted that's matching to it. That helps a little bit. The tabbing of it, if, if you can see, it automatically tabs or formats the sections. So when I tabbed, or sorry, returned key, that one, it went to match up with it's corresponding, is that right? It's corresponding open bracket. Another feature in our studio though, which is quite new. So if you're on an older version, you might not see this, but if you go to tools, global options, code, display, at the bottom of this option here in this global, so this would be set for all of your systems, if you're on your own computer, you can highlight the R function calls so you can see what is also denoted as a function because they're all the same color at the moment in terms of text color. And you've got this thing called rainbow parentheses. So if I apply both of those, you can now see that these functions are blue in text and the rest of the code is in white, which does help highlight. We've got three functions here which correspond to the slide. You've got ggplot, geonpoint, and AES. They're all deemed to be functions because there are corresponding brackets. So now I can see it by color as well as by the brackets. The, am I? I am recording. So um, the you can't really see with this bracket bit, but I will put some more underneath. Every time I do an open bracket, a closed bracket is done automatically and you can see they change color for each one. Not everybody likes them. That's absolutely fine, but they can be quite nice to sort of see what would be corresponding by color. So this outside one is pink and the inside one is orange. Each function has some information on this occasion in it, like ggplot2, I've got the data part in here and the AES, the aesthetic, I've got X and Y. The X and Y are separated by a comma. So we've given arguments, as they're called, of a function, this word here, and they're separated by commas. So there's a lot of punctuation involved with ggplot2 as well as functionality. 
just want to pause if there are any questions and then I can drink as well. Okay. There's a lot of code written out here. And what's quite nice about the function arguments is that the order of them is uh, sort of assumed by the function. You don't have to write in these bits where it says equals. So data equals or X equals or Y equals. But it is quite nice to do that, at least in the beginning, because it's it just reminds you as you, it, I do it. I'm more of a boast in my code to keep it clearer to my future self and maybe somebody else who's coming along who's not so familiar with this code. So you can run ggplot without the data part in it, let's say, and your chart runs. You don't get an error and it just opens up on the um, on the right. You can't see that there was a change because it was the same one, but the arrows here as well to flip between your previous charts, as you can see, it went from blank, blank, and you can move between them. You don't have to run them again. You can do if you like. I'm going to put my data back in. And I am going to highlight the fact that you can also switch these around. So you can sort of force your arguments. So if I changed my y to be d cubicles and my x to be d weight, changes the chart. And that's fine. I did used to say it could be confusing, but other people have said, no, that's fine. That's reasonable. You can do it that way. So you just have to sort of be mindful that you've changed it. But if I removed both actually, just so that you know, if you hold down the Alt key and then use your mouse to highlight, you can go down. You can highlight down. As you can see, my cursor goes uh, vertically to highlight. So if I then go across, you can see I've just highlighted this square. So there's a little bit of a coding trick there, which is nice. If I delete those two and then do Control and Enter, sorry, I've been forgetting to say to run it, it goes back to x being d cubicles and y being d weight because that's default order x first y second which is what those things are saying i'm going to do control z to reduce to put that back and put it back as x and y just to make it clearer there are many other charts you can use and um, i think we're going to cover geom bar geom line Box plot and histogram. But there are many, many more, and it goes into more detail in the R for Data Science book, which we have been covering at the book club, which is a really informal NHSR community group where we've just got together and read a bit of the book together and then tried out the exercises. And you're very welcome to join in. And that's on a Friday at two o'clock every other Friday. And I put notices in the Slack group just to remind people and myself that it's running. The great thing, that was it, grammar of graphics. That's what I'm trying to remember. So the grammar of graphics is the fundamental principles of ggplot2, but that has extended out in, even into the Python packages. Uh, I think it's Seaborn as well, because it's the fundamental principles as opposed to the code itself. And that's layering within your graphics. You start with your data, you move on to what your X and Y is if you have that, and then you can add in other sections to it. Um, People who've used uh, GIS, uh, uh, what, I don't know what GIS stands for, QGIS, for example, mapping, that concept is the same where you start off with your base layer of this is this is the UK and then these are the regions and then this is the uh, boundary for PCT, not PCTs, they've, they've disbanded a long time ago. Oh, be new, it's trust, let's get acute trust. And so you move them to the layers, layer upon layer, and so you'd be more familiar in terms of mapping and that's very similar, I think, in concept to these charts. We can add other data. So you could have a line on top of your dots, or you can add other dots on top of dots if you wanted, for example. In this scenario, I'll just write it out. I'm going to write. Now I'm going to give you the chance to add in your layer. So this if you add a plus at the end of your line and then write in Geom Smooth. Um, I'll give you just a couple of minutes with me not talking so you've got some space to think and just try it out. It's just about attempting it, it's not about getting it right. But you're using the function geom smooth and you're, you're essentially using the same aesthetics as the hint. And just have a go to see if you 
see what you get, see what the chart looks like. I'll stop talking for a minute. 11.36. Not sure that was a whole minute. It's very difficult to tell. Um, but a bit of peace for a second while I was uh, drinking as well. <laughs> so that's good for me. So just giving you extra time here because my thing was just being noisy. I'm just going to get rid of that. I should just put that on quiet. Cool. The plus is a new layer. If you have started typing, you should see that you get this prompt, this, uh, or it's not autocorrect, is it? Autosense? No, it will come to me at some point randomly. Smooth, I've started typing it. And if you wanted to finish off the word, if you're not familiar with it, if you do the tab key, it takes the prompt and says, yes, I'll accept that one. So the tab takes the rest of the words and just fills it in for me. Did the brackets for me as well, A-E-S. It's very short. If I do the bracket, if I do tab, it does the brackets, which is nice. And if I just copy out what I did before, which is d x equals d cubicles, comma y equals d weight, control and enter, even though it's in the middle of my my cursor's in the middle of my code, it will just run that chart code and nothing above it. So you can see in the console it says the code I've run, which is this bit here on these two lines and then this thing that comes up in orange. Now this can look like an error message and what's a bit confusing um, because it's more accessible is that errors and warnings and just notifications are all in orange. So there's no different differentiation We're using red, for example, because that's not always accessible to people. This has nothing written at the beginning saying warning or error. So it's information, which can be really confusing. It's like, what do you ignore and what do you not ignore? So on the library tidyverse that I ran before on the slide there were lots of warnings the warnings were saying I was loading something that was on um, a, an earlier version of our studio it still runs but it's just a warning just so that you know just like a this is this is a bit something you must pay attention to slightly because it could cause a problem but on the whole it's okay errors broken and this is saying geom smooth is being used and the default because I haven't said what it is in terms of method is Lois. Um, and I'm pausing there because I can't remember what Lois means. It gives the squiggly line in statistics. And I'm sure every statistician in this room, if there is somebody is wincing when I say it's a squiggly line, because it's not, it's a statistical line. But it's a particular form and uh, it's just telling me which one it's using. It's using the default. And that's what it looks like on the slide. But you might want it to be, well, that must be a linear, you, you want a linear fit rather than a non-linear fit. There you go. My slide has explained to me what the squiggly line means. It's non-linear, meaning that it matches the data according to where the data points are falling. So you have this line that goes across in this layer and a gray section to show the, uh, the numbers, I think. So this has only got, this has got fewer points between it, I think. So it sort of varies over time. You might be more familiar with a linear fit and you can, um, in a sense, not force, but you can select the method that's used by that function, geom smooth. And that needs to go between these two brackets. This is where I say that I get stuck between these brackets. I can't really highlight it very well. So there's a two closed brackets together. So that would be here on line 12 for me, where I'd put a comma in there. And so it's part of the geom smooth, not the aesthetic, where I'd add in method equals, and you can see it's recognized it tab it, put some equals in, and then put LM. And the LM can be in single quotations or double quotations. If I do control and enter, it still tells me I'm using this geom smooth using formula Y to Z X, but it's no longer telling me the method because I've, I've enforced the method and told it explicitly what to use. So again, it's not a warning and it's not an error, it's just information. And there was something else I wanted to say about this. No, 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 can't remember. No, it will probably come to me. 
and that's what it looks like in terms of being a straight line. There are two points here which are interesting in that they are low in cubicle average difference but also low which is what we want in difference in weight or average weight which is what we want so it'd be the question is what's going on there that's uh, working out very well and the hypothesis is that the two sites have seen we've only got one other data source in this regard which is staffing increases have they increased or not yes or no binary one zero true false lots of words for binary we can map color onto the aesthetic attributes to see the staff increase and I'll give a warning here because it's a really useful thing to do as an analyst but just bear in mind that when you're doing your charts in terms of accessibility which is something I've learned from the work of the government's analysis function they do a lot of work around accessibility in excel spreadsheets and now they've done some work on charts if you have just color in your chart or even in your data set that means something without anything explicit next to it it doesn't make it necessarily accessible to everybody which is the the intention but for yourselves if you're just saying okay i just want to test this hypothesis i'll apply a color to these points and see what i see that's fine it was just a kind of like a with a warning so we're going to add color to the chart depending on the value of staff increase one or zero and again this comes in where you've got your commas this is getting quite complex code in a sense there's a lot of lines um, i'm going to bring this in so that it's not so uh squashed so it looks a bit easier to read that was what i was going to say you don't necessarily have to have these spaces for the code to run it can be all squished in but always write your code so it's easy to read and because we're used to having spaces between our punctuation marks just generally and that's why I was moving the layout with whether it had a line down or line out, making it easier for yourself to read and scan, because ultimately this has to be human readable as well as machine readable. So I'm going to be trying to put this in this section of Geon Point to add the colour in, and it is actually within the aesthetic. So it's within this X, Y, comma, comma, and then comes down to this third section where it says color. So if I go into the point on my code, do a comma after D weight, and I don't have to write it the English way, but I will do. You can write color as in C-O-L-O-R. Um, you'll also find that later tomorrow when we cover a dplyr function, which is summarize, because it can be a Z or it can be an S. It uses both. Not every package is kind of like international using UK, and I'd also say it's Australian and New Zealand familiar spellings, but I quite like that they do that. So colour in the UK format with a U, but you don't have to do that, equals staff increase and then control and enter to run it. I'll share that code so you've got it all together in the chat and you can just run that. The plot's a bit squashed because I've got it all squashed up, but if you do, if you click on Zoom, that opens it up to a new open window tab if you have that functionality if you're on the cloud um, as it did for when we made the data set pop out you can see these are the default colors and sometimes you can notice that something's an r chart because they have this kind of salmon pink pink and this turquoise blue rather than primary colors which aren't always available or accessible to people so that's that's quite a giveaway when it's an r chart a basic like straight off chart and we can see that there is something interesting going on there that there was a staff increase um, in these two points specifically there were in other points to be fair too but notably so so we could take that hypothesis a bit further and investigate it on the basis of a staff increase even though the cubicles moved down the weighting also moved down maybe it was a different kind of staff increase compared to the others worth investigating I'm going to close that because it's already open down here and then I just wanted to say how I get so confused and there's probably a lot of work about it and there is more that you can read about more um, workshops that I'm sure will be available from the past conferences or even this current one in terms of where your colors can be on your ggplot 
but this code here is just to show that the color equals red. He in this section, this example on the top is outside of the AES, the aesthetic of points. And on this one, it's inside, which is what we did here. Uh, you can just overwrite it as make it completely red. So if I take this code, I'll just copy it over, make a new one. And instead of having color equals staff increase, this represents the bottom code. And I will just share that with you as it works. If I get rid of the staff increase and do, I'm using double quotations, you can use single. If you do one of the open ones, it does the closed ones automatically for you, which is nice. If I do red and control and enter, I get red, which I think is the default red. But if I cut that out and put it between the brackets, that's putting it into the um, geom point as opposed to the aesthetic. Oh, no, that was the wrong one. It changes the color and it's a different kind of red because I think it's a darker red. So it's applying it globally. So where you put your color and your points matters and sometimes they work, but they might not have the effect that you necessarily expect. So I get I struggle with this, this openly admit I need to spend more time looking at these visualizations because um, often things work. But then if you add other more complex information in, it stops working because it was working but not as I intended it to. It was sort of like the red was working, but it's not quite the right red I was looking for. My way around that, which is why I don't quite know it all at the moment, is that I use other people's code and I work really hard at making my chart work and then I just use my own code repeatedly. But if you want to find out more, and, and ggplot2 is immense. It's a whole area in itself with visualizations. There's a lot you can do and there's some amazing things, um, very creative. There are great resources out there, and I'll cover that in a second. Any sort of questions on that, particularly as I kind of went and skirted around a difficult part? Please feel free to ask me a question about it. If I can't answer it today, I would go off and ask other people who know it well. Because part of coding, to be fair, is not knowing everything. It's also being able to search for stuff, which we will cover in some sections. How to search for things. That's like true coding. Right, we can apply the size globally, and this is what we're doing when it is in this section of the geom point, it's being globally applied. So if I change it to size from color equals, and it's not in quotations because the number is needed to be a number, you can see the points have all globally been applied as a massive size, four seems immense. I think, and the other thing about coding is just trying stuff out if you're not entirely sure. If I put that within the aesthetic, oh, it does it. I was going to say it wouldn't work, but it did. And it does. I think it stops working if you add other stuff in there. But yeah, there you go. It works. And that can be quite confusing. It can, it's caught me out on a number of occasions, whether it's in the point or in the aesthetic. So if you are looking at other people's code, just look out for those brackets about which part it's working with. This next section, if I write it out actually and say the details as I go along, as I do ggplot, which is the call to the chart, I'm saying data equals capacity underscore AE, which is the data source, I'm putting a plus at the end because it's a layering. And it, I think this is right. It always has to be at the end of that line. It doesn't work if it's at the beginning of the line. I am going to give that a go. Geom. Oh, it did find that, didn't it? Geom point, even though I misspelt it. AES for aesthetic. I'm going to be explicit and say X equals D cubicles. It's a horrible word to spell. Y equals D weight. That runs. If I move that plus to the beginning of the line, I break it because it's very, very specific. It needs to be at the end. I thought it did that and I was just going to give it a test. And then if I continue and do plus geom point, if you're anything like me, you'd be like, oh, I'm rewriting this and it's a bit tedious and I can't spell D cubicles. And if I need to change the name, your alarm bell should be going that things are being repeated. And particularly as I'm really slow at typing that Y equals, oh, I'm, 
yep, see, your attention waned. And that's what happens when you repeat yourself. What we can do, though, is to move these because they're exactly the same. I'm saying I want my points to be on an X and Y using this data, and I want my smooth to be on the same data, the same X and the same Y. And to save this kind of repetition of coding, you can remove all of that. So they're empty functions now, but the reference is then moved right up to the top. I'm just in control and copy, and I put my aesthetic in at the top part. I'll give you the code. Um, and you can see my lines, my formatting has gone all a bit funny. A nice thing you can do is if you highlight just anywhere within, so I've just highlighted pretty much a point on each of the lines, and then control and I, it indents it a bit nicely for me. So it does it for me, just kind of puts it all in the right place. So I've done geom point twice, which is not what I wanted. I wanted geom smooth. See, attention waned. And now that I've removed all of that kind of code, <sighs> Geom smooth. What have I done here? Ah, I need a bracket. My nemesis. There we go. <laughs> I needed a bracket and against my AES. So I needed an open and closed bracket. So I always get caught out with brackets. And there you go. Action in place. I have now two empty functions at the bottom, point and smooth. And because I've taken away that visual clutter, I can see my problems and my errors and it means as well if one of these things changes I only have to change it once so d weight becomes average weight written out I only have to change it once <clears throat> now I usually get stuck repeatedly as we get here and then I get to this bit and then I think oh this is why I like my ggplot2 that's it I, th this is the best bit and it's brilliant and it can be really compli complex and complicated and you can do really, really long bits of code for charts. But facet wrap and facet grid, which we don't cover, but it's similar in, in concept, is why we do this. So let me just see if I've got all the points. I've got G on point. I'm going to remove the smooth, put in a plus at the end, and then do facet wrap. I wonder if this works because I've changed my code. I'm going to just start again, I think going off topic here, ggplot, calling the chart code, data equals capacity underscore AE, which is the data, plus at the end to the next layer, geom point to keep it simple, AES aesthetics, x equals de cubicles for the <laughs> cubicles, I can't spell cubicles, y equals d weight for the x and y. At the end of that, plus facet wrap. So you can see there were two facets there. A tilde, which is often located next to your return key. Mine's with tab, not tab, shift and that key to get the squiggle. And I'm going to do staff increase and control and enter because I like to use the keyboard shortcuts to run. I'm going to zoom it to make it a bit bigger so you can see and copy the code into the chat. So you can just copy and paste if you haven't already got the code working. Now this is a really simple example um, with just two variables in a sense but the nice thing about it is you could spend a long long time creating some um, beautiful chart and then have to reproduce it say for all the wards or all of the instant categories you may have or maybe if it's about patient information and using facet means take that same chart code and split it out by all of these categories and in this occasion it's true and false. And it's a different way of looking at the data as well. Whereas before, when it was overlaid, we used colors to see the difference. This gives kind of different information. It's a different chart. Same points, splitting them out. We could kind of see that before with the colors. But this is really stark that the false, there's a lot of them. That's my uh, statistical view. There's a lot of that. And on the true, very few staff increases. So it's a different way of looking at the same information, even though they're points. And using facet wrap makes it really, really quick to repeat that. So if anybody here is using statistical process control charts, they're really you, they're brilliant, lovely. Um, but you quickly get to that point, I think, where you need to rep reproduce them for multiple areas or uh, systems or categories or groups. And that can be quite labor intensive. 
So just one line of code splits it out. That function as well, because you can see it's a different color, it's got these brackets, it's a function, can be incre developed, increased, added to, and we can do ncol equals one. And what we're saying in that one is number of columns. So we've only got two bits here, and we can then move the data around. Just a tiny bit of code, and suddenly we can look at our data differently. Now, I wouldn't have been able to do it as quickly in Excel. I probably wouldn't have looked at it. This can be used in exploratory and also final product. So I could look at it this way, which I, I'm not sure I could quite see these two points down here as being so obvious in this format, but you might be able to see something else in there. Maybe the um, the line of movement is, what's it not line, like the geom smooth type thing. You might see that linear detail and you can add it to it separately as well. I love facet wrap, there's facet grid as well. Definitely work out, work, look into those I'd say. So I'm going to give you a demonstration now, unless there are any questions about faceting or um, anything really. I mean, I'm just going by the last bit. Can you put a line of best fit? I would say that was a G on smooth. I'm not sure if I've quite understood if it's the same, wrong section. Let's try it, G on smooth. I was just wondering about that when we said it. So if I moved my aesthetic to the global, put a comma between it. Oh, and then we have lowest though. So it's gone very squiggly here for the true because there's there's a few points. So if I made that one into um, method equals LM for linear, which might be might be the equivalent of best fit. I'm stretching my my views on this. So yes, you can, and that's quite nice because before we did it for both together, and now you can see that that line of best fit was being. It's it's kind of coming from these points, isn't it, with the false, and true has one, and you could see that slightly, but it is a bit it's a bit more challenging because there are fewer points. But yes, you can explore that. Nice question. Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking that myself. Like, mm, can it, would it work? Yes, it does. Statistically, it's a different matter. Code programmatically, yes, it does work. So demonstrating geom charts. Now there are lots of charts, um, but let's have a look at ggplot. Day, oh, I'm going to write capacity underscore ae. I'm going to be a bit lazy. Plus at the end, geom histogram. It finds it. I'm going to tab it. Finish off my words, AES, do D weight. I'll share that with you so you can have a, just the code if you wanted to. Zoom it, or should I just move it along? It kind of resets itself. So we're getting, oh, at the bottom here, some information again. It's not a warning, it's a, an informative piece saying the bins have been set automatically at 30, and it might be better to set that yourself. And it, the code is then extended to say within the histogram, so not in this section with the aesthetic, but outside, so a comma, forgot the grammar, punctuation, I mean, a comma and then bin width equals, thankfully it finds it and I don't have to type it, 10. And then you can change your bin width, your bucketing system on your chart, which makes it a bit more uniform in its spread. And you no longer get that informative information about what's happened because you've told it what to do. Interesting. Gives you some idea of stuff. But you might want to do a bar plot. And again, I suppose each section has their own uh, val validity in how you look at your chart. So the same thing again, ggplot with the data capacity underscore AE, a plus at the end, geom col. AESX in this case is site and Y equals attendance 2018. Control and enter to run. And we get this, which is actually quite horrible. It's difficult to view because it's all over the place. It's, you, you can't really see any pattern in there because it's just thrown together. Geom Cole has taken the data set and done the counts for you. 
if you had the counts already done, there's another function for that, which will do the same, but it just takes it from the aggregate form. And that's not a problem. It's just that there's no order to this. You can't quite see the chart. And what you can do is apply functions within your GG, so it moves within your GG plot. So you can, I'm trying to say you can move, you can use your functions from other packages like G, uh, dplyr or base R within it. And one of them that we're going to use here is reorder. And I always forget where reorder is from. So I wonder if reorder is base, but I'm not sure. I'm going to put reorder in another comma and attendance 2018. Control and enter. And then it looks very different now. Now we can see a bit more. We can sort of see these bottom bits here. So um, those are the sites, I think, aren't they, with the numbers? But they're ordered now, lowest to highest. I'm just going to find out where this one is. I'll tell you later again, but I'm looking at F1 in reorder. And it opens up in the help file down here. And it comes from the stats package, which I didn't realize. We will go into a bit more about what the functions do. I just wanted to know where that one was from. But this is my favorite one because it is something that I've spent so long creating in Excel that I have spent less time thinking about what it is actually saying to me because box plots aren't the easiest to explain. Um, I've written ggplot again for the function data equals capacity underscore AE and then the plus at the end geom box plot. And there was a wonderful example which is listed on my website with this uh, presentation slide deck uh, for Simon Wellesley Miller. He did a talk for AFA analysts, just a really, really short lightning talk on breaking down a box plot and explaining it. And it's just superb. So I would direct you to that wonderful and quite funny bit about how to do uh, box plots because I will completely fail at it if I try to explain what it's saying. But I, I'm just going to show you how to do it because it's really quick. And then I should go away and watch that and then I'll be better at explaining it. And this is box plot. And all I've done is two lines of code saying the aesthetic should be staff increase. So it's split the box plot part by the staff increase, but using D weight. So I, th I think the thing for me is with the box plots, if you look on the side, this is the distribution. So you can see the false has got, we already know this actually from seeing the points, there are more points in it. So it's a smaller box and there are fewer points for the true value. So it's more stretch what it could be within that section. It's got more, yeah, stuff. Check out his um, talk, really good. Box plots though are, they take many, many sort of like sections to code if you're using it or code to uh, movement, I would say. Is it movement? In Excel to build. And you can also add, again, with layers, I'm going to give myself a bit more space because it's a bit squished on here. You can layer your code to add in things like the labels, the titles, and this applies to any of the charts that you're doing in ggplot. It's just we're going to use this in the example for the box plots. So at the end of this code, if I give you the code for the box plot, put the plus in at the end and then do labs, short for labels, title equals box plots are great. If I run that, control and enter, you can see the box, the um, title has appeared at the top. And then I can continue adding in that lab section with another comma, so another um, argument, and put y equals weighting, because d weight is a bit, a bit specific, really. You need to explain it. I was just about to write d weight, which would be silly. Control and enter to run that. And now we can see d weight has become weighting. And that's how you can change your um, labels. Again, that can be on any chart at all because you've just added this layer. And you might wish to save it. And there are several ways of saving it. Before I show the code, in this section here, you can export where you've got your plot. So you can see your plot. You can navigate back and forth between the ones that you've done. You can zoom in and you can export. Save it as an image, save it as a PDF, or copy it to your clipboard if you're going to put it into another file. Save as image dot dot dot. They're all wizards. The way you can alter, which is why I don't do this because I can't control my mouse, you 
change the size. Oh, I'm terrible at mouse control. You change your size this way. You can change it in your width and height up here, but I'm not, I've never really been able to work out how big or small and what it looks like. You can give it a name. So I'm going to call it R plot. Ticket view plot after saving. Save. Oh, and then it opens it up straight away, which is actually quite small in the HTML. If I go back to the files, anything that you've saved as a file, which goes onto the hard drive if you're using your computer or into the cloud file system, it will appear at the bottom. So this was called rplot.png. So going back to the code to do the same thing, but within code, not in the wizard, although I think, no, it didn't show it in the code. If I put plus at the end and then, oops, plus, use the functions gg save and then put plot, well, I'll put r plot code dot png and then do control and enter to run it. I do get an error. And what's really perplexing is it says can't save it, can't use it, or can't save it to an object. So I think it means it can't save it up here, but it does save down in the file structures. So it does work, but it seems to be something on cloud that I get stuck. It I get an error, but it doesn't actually affect what we're doing because I do get this same thing, but huge because my default here hasn't changed the units or the height or the width. So we can do that in code. There are more arguments that go into the function ggsave. Comma, always to delineate, delineate, that's a difficult word to say, your arguments, units equals, ooh, equals cm, because I think it's default to unit, um, inches, because it's a US kind of focus program, but centimeters can be added in. Height equals 10, so that's a number, no, no quotations around it for text, width equals 8. I get the same error, but let's see, I've sh shared the code with you, and if I click on the PNG file, it looks the same. <laughs> Huge. Now, I'll pause here and just say that I spent a long time when I first started importing and exporting and getting all these charts and then putting them into PowerPoint presentations. But if you come back tomorrow or catch up later on the YouTube, um, we will be covering briefly, though, uh, our markdown. And that's super helpful because that is your report output. And your report output could be, as we discussed or I showed very, very early on, it could be PowerPoint presentations. So everything would be within our studio rather than going in and out and, and saving it here and taking it to another program to do. So that's that's the beauty of R. And there's other beauty as well, but that is some of the beauty. Any questions regarding saving files? Um, uh, saving images as such? I find it really, I found it and still find it very tricky to get the right size within it, but you can control it much more easily and powerfully within R Markdown. But getting into R Markdown, there's a lot more stuff to kind of get into it. Is it always a PNG? That's an excellent question. I think the default is a PNG, but what does the function do? We will find out more about this GG save and I'll see in there if you can control if it's a JPEG or something else. I think PNG is quite um, efficient in size. As I recall, it's not as detailed as an SVG. But uh, let's go through how do we find out what this function does, its potential. It's a brilliant question. It's like you, it's part of the system. It's brilliant. I'd not thought of that. Right, GG save. So if I write GG save on the line on my editor, with the brackets and I want to find out more about it, even though I've kind of started writing, I get this kind of list up that says what the arguments could be. So I could put the file name in, the, which will be what we did before with the R plot underscore code, which you can, lots of these default if you don't tell it what to do. And I can't see anything there necessarily on what type of file it is. So that might be the answer that this particular 
function doesn't let you save it as anything else, but let's keep looking. So that gives you a short list. If you click, I think actually within the word and do F1, so mine's actually two, um, two keys on my keyboard, it opens up here directly with the help file. It works in that regard because I've loaded Tidyverse. So I've already got Tidyverse open in my project session, my workspace session. So I can just say, what's this function? Because it already knows that I need it from one of the packages that are already loaded. And there's a lot of information in the documentation. This is always available in all of the CRAN packages. It's just available. It varies across CRAN packages, how detailed. I was just kind of thinking it's available, but sometimes it's not brilliant, but this is quite good. This is a good example. I used to not really look at usage, which would answer your question about whether it's a PNG or if it could be anything else. You get these argument information about where to go. I'm not seeing any of that bit there. Details, I would always go down, I still do actually, is look at the examples. And these examples will run, it says not run, but it, I, I can't remember what that refers to. Somebody did explain that on Twitter. But these will run because they use a data source that is built into R. So they're always available. MT cars is car data set. There's a data set that's not used so much now because of its um, connection to Fisher, and he has a bit of a dubious history in terms of eugenics, and that's the Iris data set. So these ones are built in, but statisticians and other people are kind of like, well, I don't really want to use Iris. I don't think it was actually his data set as well, so it's a bit like, mm. they're moving away from it. So they will use things like empty cars, or there's a package as well, but this is a package rather than built in called Palmer Penguin, which is a, a nice one if you interested but these will just run you don't need to load any packages to check them so that's the help file that's listed in there that's available on your computer on your session your computer um, you could always google it as well and we'll look into searching through the internet and if you wanted to write in the console so you don't want it in your script necessarily because you're going to save that if you do question mark gg save that brings up the same document up in the help file. But for those of you who, yeah, if you're on the cloud and if you've installed all the package, you, you won't have this actually, sorry, just thinking about it, because I only asked you to install Tidyverse. It won't work for everybody. It might work for some, depending on whether you filled in all the, it did all the pre-work. Those on the cloud, like me, you can see this. If I do beep, question mark it doesn't find beep because i haven't opened and loaded the beepar package which does exist in the cloud because i have um, installed it just to show you in the packages there's a whole list of the packages that are available and you can look for what's listed and i have here beepar where we loaded it before using code you can just tick it i won't do that just yet i'm going to write here it does suggest doing question mark, question mark, beep. I'll do that. And it gives me options because it's like this matches beep, but I don't really know which package you're looking at. In fact, there are three from beep and beepar. So I'm looking for beepar and beep. And it's a really nice, small, it's absolutely tiny package and it plays a sound when you run it. And I, it won't work on the cloud because the cloud doesn't have a connection to your computer sound, but it's really good on your own computer. I've used it if I'm running really, really long code. My attention span is really, really small. So I kind of run some code that I know is going to take a while. I want to look away, do something else, and I want it to sound when it's run. So I run my code and at the bottom, I write a new line of code that says beep and then run it with a sound and you've got various options. You've got different sounds that you can run, which is really good for sound quality as well if you've got that connection. In my system as well, if I was looking for it and I haven't loaded it still, I can do a single quotation. There are just so many, like there are several different ways to do things, aren't there? Um, I've started typing BPAR, which is the package with a single question mark. Couldn't find it when I just wrote beep but I wrote the package first, then I did colon, colon, to then say this is a pathway to a function. And I've got these options now of all these ones that match, so I can choose them and I can see a bit more of information about them too. I think 
if I get my mouse, no, I think you just get the top section. Yeah, you can't navigate them. You can press F1 for more information. So if I then went to beep and then did it, I get it even though I've not loaded it because I've been explicit. This is the package, the direction to it, and this is the function. If I go back to the packages tab, you can click on that button and then it loads it, library B part, and it's super quick because it's really, really small. So now it's loaded. It won't do anything on the cloud though because my sound's not connected. You can untick to unload. And I think you've got a cross here to uninstall, remove package. So there's a lot of functionality within these packages. I was just thinking while we're here, it's quite useful to know you can also install and that will take it from CRAN. You probably want CRAN the most, um, but if I'm looking for something that I know is on there like Lubridate, you can start typing it and it finds it for you. And so you don't have to write the code yourself. It does it all for you in your installation within the R Studio. That's nice too. And the other thing to sort of bear in mind is update packages. Packages get updated frequently and you might not need all of these things, but you might want to keep them up to date. So I'm just thinking dplyr is now actually version 10. That's on the cloud. And that can help you if you have access rights to do that, to keep your packages updated. So there's a, a lot of functionality, even just with a few buttons there. Or you can browse packages on CRAN as well. So there's a lot of information in the package tab. If you're on the web and you wanted to look for some more information, you can get help on things like our Studio Community, which is in dark mode on my computer. <laughs> I hope you can see this okay. This is a really friendly uh, site, often related to the packages that are our Studio packages, like the Tidyverse, but not always. It's not um, specific to that. So there'll be other references to other packages because they work with them or because people are using R. The downside of this that I find is quite a downside is that if I can find the information, it might be at the very bottom. Oh, this is a popular one. The topic closes 21 days after the last reply. So that means that if anything changes, which they do do, these functions and packages get updated, or people find the answer and it never was answered, they can't add to it. It's a bit of a downside, but it is a friendly place. Another friendly place is the Slack group, which is not found because the link's not correct. Oops. Reopen. I just did that automatically. The Slack group, which I've shared the link to, we don't have that history and um, it's not really a code sharing place, but lots of friendly people who will understand often the acronyms that are so prevalent in the NHS and in social care, where we say, oh no, I need to help with um, RTT and MHSDS, I'm thinking some random acronyms. They'll mean things to some people, even though you're asking a technical question, let's say. So it's, it's a nice place. It's just not a particularly great technical place in a sense for many questions. It's a great place to connect with people who can help you with your question though. And Stack Overflow. So that actually has its own technique. So I think it's just got an image of it there because there's a, a it, trying to say, um, R is very difficult in that it has many options for solutions. If you're going to Stack Overflow, if you are familiar with it, for things like SQL and Excel, or maybe even like SPSS or MATLAB, there may be like one definitive best answer. It's best, the best way of doing it. But R has many solutions. So you might go on and ask a chart question and you get base R, Plotly and ggplot as responses. They're all correct, but they all vary depending on what you're using. So it has its own kind of process. Cheat sheets are big in um, the R community. People use these. They're, they're not very accessible, I've read since, because of the layout. But if visually is helpful, you can see that it kind of like in um, format of like long form, not long format, but you know, a uh, columned text. And I think people like print them off into big sizes and then use that as a reference. And there's probably bits in there that might, you might not have known about until you looked at the cheat sheet, which is quite useful to do. And there's quite a number of them. I think as well, in, 
here somewhere. <laughs> I always forget where. Somebody pointed out that they appear in the uh, menus within our studio. And maybe it's in help, actually. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Help. There are cheat sheets somewhere. Cheat sheets. It says cheat sheets. And then you can choose some of the ones that are the most popular, probably re related to the products that our studio also posit now as it is known as maintain. So you've got a few of them that are listed and they will take you to an external site, though, which is PDF. But what we want to do as well, we've shown I've shown you how to save a an image. But you probably want at some point to save this script. So at the moment, it's just listed as untitled one. And if I open a new one, it will be, oh, where do we find these? Sorry, was that related to the cheat sheets or a different question? Sorry, I didn't see the comment, so I'm out of out of sync with the question. Hopefully you're typing to explain which bit that I've missed. It was the cheat sheets and then you had them online, but I guess they are solution. Yeah, these ones in help cheat sheets will take you to the online version, which that website takes you to as well. Oh, but it downloads it. I didn't realize that. So that would be what you could see online. But it takes you through. Um, saving your script. <clears throat> you want to save this script. It says untitled one. It's as you'd expect for many Microsoft products, say, you, and other ones as well. File, save, which is control S or save as. If you just save, it will prompt you to give it a name because untitled one is just like the default. So if I say my script, save. Oh, and then you can see right at the bottom, it pops it at the base there. So if you good practice, which I haven't been doing is save it at the beginning, make some changes, I'll get rid of GG save and then control and S because I like those bits and then I'll update my script and save it. If you like reading reference books as well, um, there are recommended reading for visualizations. There are lots of resources though available and I'm not sure having looked at some of these since that these are all available online. I think this one you have to pay for. Fundamentals of visualization as well, I think. Oh no, that one is free online. So this person, Klaus Wilkie, I think his name is, he's also on Twitter. So he shares a lot of his other PowerPoint, they're not PowerPoint presentations, sorry, um, our presentations on visualizations. And he did a talk, I think, at our studio this year. And of course, R for Data Science, which you know is online too. A bit of an art interlude really quickly before lunch. I bet you're quite hungry now. People have fun with R creatively. And I'm sure this happens with other um, organizations as well, uh, organizations, I mean, um, programs, but I've just been really taken with the R. So there's a, a Twitter handle called Accidental Art. Oh, this is another person, sorry. I think it was actually Cedric that I meant when I said he's done a talk. I think it's Cedric who's done a talk on visualizations. And here he's shared a, a visualization that's gone wrong. But there's kind of a celebration of it. So it gets retweeted by this Twitter handle. And I think it's nice because this wasn't what was intended, but it has a beauty in itself. And people just share these things. I actually quite like that. That's really nice. I don't look at that as enough, I think. But some individuals have worked at computational art. So they combine R, and you can do this, I'm sure, with things like Python as well, with mathematics to create images. And Danielle does amazing stuff. Like I can't fathom how these are produced in code but they are she's just uh, amazing i don't think she necessarily shares all the code for these things because some people are using it like artists and selling their their wares as it were and i think this one might open now generative art as it's called so i think this is also quite good so people have fun it kind of makes you a better programmer. It's fun to see the output of your hard labor and code. It's not for everybody, but there are things like this where I've taken this code from, let's see, I forget how to say her name. So she's done a talk for our ladies as well. Ijimaka, I, I, I follow her on Twitter and she shared her code here to get people started with um, doing some visualizations and code. So I think if I go to that, you can see the chart, the, the 
the slides, I should say. Oh no, that's the PNG. The slides have got a different. A different thing. Just to bear in mind, because not everybody will have encountered this problem necessarily, but if uh, presentations are published on GitHub, some of our networks, including my own trust network, block it. So I used to have that problem with my presentation slides, which are built in the same way as these, but I publish them with a different uh, URL now. So you might not be able to access some of these depending on your VPN, Wi-Fi security type thing. So if I just go through, she's given code and then the output to get people started to have a look at this. And this uses ggplot2. ggplot2. And this is the co polar, which you could use if you so wished to create a pie chart. Right, and I think that is the end of that session. Kind of run, rush through. I'm hoping that was okay for everybody. I can pause. Uh, I can, maybe at some point, stop it. There we go, stop. Stop, stop recording. So thank you for everybody and uh, catch up with everybody online because this is going to go onto YouTube. Fine, so I will say 